What's happening, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the 420 News. Uh, I see a couple of you already out there in the hot box getting the comments flying in. Keep them coming, guys. Get your hellos and all you want to say into the hot box uh, coming. <coughs> As you could tell, I had a bit of a pre-420 warm-up there. Must repack that ball, actually. <laughs> Just wolf, wolf down a, a, a Sunday munch there as well uh, to make it sure that uh, we weren't late for the stream. <laughs> Wouldn't be like me to be late. Uh, but how is everybody out there anyway on this fine Sunday here in Cork? Lovely weather for the ducks. <laughs> yeah, you guessed it. It's a bit wet here today. Um, Roving Reporter, what is happening, my man? Yes, bong o'clock it is. Um, packing this one up here now, and I'm going to hit this with all y'all. <laughs> so, boom, there we go. Bobby says, I forgot we changed the clocks. I thought maybe you weren't streaming. Almost made me uh, go to the casino. <laughs> I was wondering that. I, see, I seen that in the uh, the half box. I was thinking, geez, Bobby's waiting early. Uh, over an hour early, Bobby. <laughs> uh, I was like, fair play to him, man. Yeah, do you know <laughs> oh, good lordy. Going to have to open the lid on this one to cool it down. I thought I put enough milk in here to cool that down. Jesus, nearly lost me tongue. Oh, tea bag's still brewing nicely, though, at least with the heat. <laughs> um, Bogwan, so what is happening, man? Happy 420 to you, too. Uh, Daniel Gormley is out there in the hot box as well. Daniel, what is happening, my man? He says, uh, Happy Sunday, Bunday, mofos. <laughs> Miles Cranach hitting us up as well. What's happening, Miles Cranach? Welcome back to the hot box. Hopefully, um, this finds you well out there on uh, this lovely Sunday. Bowl is packed anyway, guys. Uh, what what are you all um, engaging in civil disobedience with today? Yeah, uh, if you are engaging with civil disobedience, um, this is not me encouraging you to uh, engage in civil disobedience. But if you are willing to participate, by all means, get involved. <laughs> to be careful with these community guidelines, don't you know? Can't be seen to be promoting like uh, illegal substances. Apparently, you know. Certainly not promoting the use of illegal sub substances, but I am encouraging people, if they so wish, to stand up for their rights and engage in civil disobedience. And that's all I'll say about that. <laughs> torch of freedom at the ready, guys. Uh, I'm about to get ready to torch this one. So here we go. Definitely do with a, an extra drop of water there inside in the bong. <laughs> I don't know if you noticed there, but I was just about to start to talk into the bong there like it was a microphone. Quickly realised what I was about to do. That. <laughs> uh, <coughs> not as bad as me almost walking into a closed door there though in Barcelona on the balcony, huh? <laughs> Oh, good times, good times. We will reminisce as well on uh, the trip to Barcelona at some point in time. Um, I was planning on maybe doing it today on this show, but it seems like we actually got a fair bit of news to get through. Um, so I think maybe we'll keep this to a 420 News show, cover these headlines that I have covered, lined up here. Um, and maybe we'll do a special stream maybe later on this evening, maybe, or uh, at some point in time anyway. Um, myself, uh, hopefully maybe the Roven reporter jumps on, maybe Mr. Wes, Green Tea, and um, we'll see, we'll open up the Zoom room there and get a couple of the, uh, the attendees to Spanibus to hop on, and they can talk about Spanibus, they can talk about the social clubs, and, you know, just what they thought about everything, and maybe what's going on in Ireland then as well, uh, maybe a bit of what's going on in the UK as well from the Roven reporter, so we'll uh, have a nice conversation there as well, um, but it just won't be on today's show. This particular one, anyway, maybe later on this evening. We see what we can organise for you fine folk. Darren Mitchell, what's happening? He says, uh, that is a lemon haze. Nice, nice. Had some lovely lemon haze, actually, over in uh, Barcelona. <laughs> Just said I won't reminisce on it, won't go over it, but <laughs> sorry. Oh, my goodness. The, uh, the Yeah, some of those lemon strains over there were off the charts. I'm a massive fan of, of lemon, as uh, green tea knows. <laughs> uh... 
<laughs> Bobby says, I've been at that for the last hour. Good man, Bobby. <laughs> Celebrating 420 twice today. Look at you. Uh, Roman reporter here saying, uh, Cherry Gasm weed with some vape and some pine- pineapple hash I found in Barcelona. Very nice. I've actually got some Barcelona hash here too. Um, this is uh, o- Oreo Biscotti, um, I-, I believe. Biscotti uh, crossed with Oreo, I think. Yeah, that, that, the hash made from that uh, plant anyway. Um, and oh, none, none of it disappointed. I have to say, like, none of what I got over there, to be fair, disappointed. Um, but anyhow, uh, <laughs> Trace of Judge Net Spanibus looked good. It was indeed. Oh, it was. Roving Reporter done a bit of judging there as well, so I look forward to, 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 to conversing with him on that one. Boom, nice one. Roving Reporter confirming there as well. He's uh, good, good to come on during the week too. Yeah, let, let's organise that between uh, a couple of us there because I would like to get a couple of you on just to have the, just the open discussion there, get a few different opinions in because um, I know I was like quite biased. I was very blown away and impressed. I was, I, I'd, I'd only one critique, um, but again... I'd be interested in hearing yours. <laughs> Daily Talker, what's happening? Welcome, welcome. Uh, happy 424 to you too, buddy. Um, John O'Regan says, welcome back. Nice one. Made it safely through. Safely. <laughs> so so easy. I, I, I definitely, like, I shouldn't admit, but, like, this, like, didn't get posted back. This came back in my bag. Um, and I, I wish I'd brought back a bigger bit of it or just a bit more of it or something because pretty fair like the the security was lax the 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 to say the least um coming back um that might not be the case next time but certainly this time when i came back geez arriving into the clock airport there was the passport control and that was it that, that was it that was all passport control came to the customs and the, the boys must have been in making their cup of tea or something you know because they weren't out checking people's bags <laughs> I was coming out of the airport I was thinking oh I wish I brought more but uh, anyhow I brought enough where I still have some left here today I got some cheetah piss as well actually jeez I brought back a bit of cheetah piss and I have this <laughs> I opened up the overhead compartment on the plane and <laughs> oh jeez the, the the smell of cheetah piss just came out to meet me jeez no matter how much that thing was wrapped up and sealed inside like the smell was not being contained by like these little sandwich baggies I think the cheetah piss was in like three of these cheetah baggies, or uh, <laughs> these sandwich baggies, and the smell still didn't get contained. So, word of warning, guys, if you're bringing cheetah piss home on the plane, <laughs> wrap it fucking well. Oh, gas, though. Yeah. <laughs> Roven Reporter says they knew how much uh, trouble you'd be in court, so they thought, fuck that, he frick. <laughs> Could be so. They might have seen my name on the list and said, "Shit, lads, run!" <laughs> and I, I, I'm not that notorious, am I? Surely not. Hopefully, anyway. Uh, Teresa says the flavors and choice was amazing. Can't wait to go back. Same, Teresa. Same. Um, looking, looking at flights already. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. So, um, shout outs pretty much done to everybody. I didn't miss anybody there tonight. Uh, apologies if I did. Keith, what's happening? What's up? <laughs> Um, so I think I got everybody there in the shout outs guys um, Bowl has been blazed Let's empty it and pack it And let's hit the first headline shall we So the first headline guys is coming out of Wexford um, So it's a and Irish Independent And it's uh, coming out of Wexford And the headline as it reads here is A motorist who crashed on a rural we- Wexford road Get this guy Get cannabis worth four hundred and twenty nine thousand euro or <laughs> oh, worth of cannabis. You know it's a uh, lot. So there you go. There, there it is up on screen. That is the headline over there on the Irish Independent. Sorry, still packing a bowl here. Um, but crazy. You know this this lad. He crashed his car. Um, this is in the middle of the day as well when this happened, and guards who were just happened to be on routine patrol in the area came up upon him. Um, they offered to, to help him to remove the car off the road, but the, they kind of noticed that the guy was acting a bit nervous. Um, and they say, but in the article, you know, they noticed the smell of cannabis. And I, I, just, I think that's just because they thought the guy was acting nervous. It's like, right, let's hit him with there's a smell of cannabis so we can search his car. Even though there probably mightn't have been any smell of cannabis, because, you know, as we get into the article there, you'll see why. 
Um, but the motorist crashed. Uh, it turned out to have 429,000 worth of cannabis in the boot of his uh, crashed vehicle. Um, he got three years in prison for this, all right? This guy is 35 years of age, and he gives his address here and his, uh, his name. I'm not going to read out his name. Um, but this was in Wexford Circuit Court because of the value of the cannabis. Couldn't be dealt with at the district court uh, because you know, it needs a higher court for uh, a, a heavier punishment. Um, the defendant's 12kk registered Vauxhall had just crashed in the townland of Fo- Foul, uh, Folksmith. Um, and the Garda went to offer ex- assistance. Uh, the driver declined any help despite the fact that his car was blocking the road. So guys, if the Garda's coming after to move your car when it's crashed, don't Take their help. It's a bit suspicious if you say, no, no, I got it, I got it. Take their fucking help. <laughs> um, he told the officers that he was on his way to Ross Lair to begin a holiday and the guard recalled that he appeared very nervous. So again, you know, as I said, they hit him with the smell of cannabis was detected at the roadside and it prompted a search of the vehicle. They have to say this because they need to give a reasonable excuse as to why they're searching the vehicle. You know, ner- him appearing nervous mightn't have been enough, you know, in, in the guard's thing. He has to just throw in there, yeah, I could smell cannabis as well, you know. Um, this uncovered three large sports bags in the boot, each one containing bags of, and this is why I think it's maybe a bit unlikely that he smelled the cannabis, they were vacuum-wrapped cannabis herb. So vacuum-wrapped, like, I, I've, I've vacuum-wrapped stuff, like, um, I've, I've rac- vacuum-wrapped cannabis, um, and, and the smell is incredibly contained. Um, I've received large containments of vacuum-wrapped cannabis, and it's, like, the smell, it doesn't come out until you open it. Um, so I I just don't believe that the cops smelt it at the side of the road because I've I've been a victim of that too many times where the cops be oh there's a smell of cannabis and they search the car but the thing is like you might have hash in the car like unless you were smoking the hash in the car there wouldn't be a smell of hash in the car to be fair off a of soap bar um but they'd still say it and they'd still maybe end up finding it uh, that was my experience back in the day I didn't smoke in the car um so they couldn't really smell it in my opinion they shouldn't have been able to smell it anyway. Um, but it still hit you with that. And I, I know it's many other people's exper- experience as well, you know, that they get stopped in search and they have absolutely nodding in the car and they haven't even been smoking the last few days. And they get hit with the, oh, there's a smell of cannabis. Get out, I'm going to search your car. <laughs> Anyhow, the, the discovery led in turn to the search of the accused uh, apartment in uh, New Ross and three officers seized 4,750 euro in cash along with a, a weighing scales, gloves and cling film. Uh, he was quizzed about what they found in the defendant said he had responded to an advert on Facebook seeking a man with a van and the uh, job was to collect a load from the outskirts of Dublin and proceed by the back roads to make a delivery in Ross Lair. Uh, for this he was to be paid two grand and he said he maintained that throughout his suspected illegality uh, although he had no knowledge of the contents of the bag. Um, so he admitted like you know, that he suspected legality but you know, he still continued with the job. That's a bit of a strange admission to make. Um, but the Gardaí were sceptical about the details of what they had been told by the individual. Um, and, and one aspect of the story which uh, held up was the Ross Lair Harbour connection. They discovered a batch of hollowed out furniture at an address there which had been rented by a friend of the accused. Um, so it seems like, you know, maybe this guy was after ha- having some furniture, you know, hollowed out furniture imported into the country that contained this cannabis. And, you know, they removed it and they were transporting it. I, I don't know what the case was there, but... You know, hollowed-out furniture is quite suspect. But uh, Gerda Delay reckoned that uh, the individual was not the boss of the drugs operation. He clearly was at the not at the bottom either. And uh, the court was advised that uh, he, the court was advised that he was jailed after receiving a previous conviction for narcotic offences in his native Poland, dating back to when he was a young man. So, like this guy, like, his previous convictions from Poland are being brought up in an, an Irish court. That's an interest them on um, um to do that to an individual, you know. And wh- I wonder what those offences were. Was he done for just possession? Was he done for dealing? Um, but they don't really kind of say that in this. Um, but he was jailed over there for it, so it must have been maybe a bit more than possession. Who knows? Um, but the, the barrister of the uh, of the individual uh, stressed that his client f- is a father of a teenage daughter and was never going to make his fortune delivering these drugs. In early since 2015 or 2016, he was in full-time employment and, engaged and was engaged to be married, and is engaged to be married, I, I suppose. Uh, Judge James McCourt said a sentence of four years with the closing 12 months suspended. The time in jail was uh, dated back to last July when the individual was uh, taken into custody. 
It's like that's that's crazy. Like you know, all right, as a half a million, almost a half a million dollar worth of cannabis, yeah. large amount of cannabis, but still like three years of this man's life. That's eighty grand apparently per year per prisoner. Like come on, you, you've heard this. I'm like a broken record saying that you know you're talking about a quarter of a million euro almost there. To, that's going to be at a cost of the taxpayer. When it should have been the other way around if we just caught up with the times, we're a bit more progressive here if our government, you know, got their heads out of their arse, had a proper conversation there recently about cannabis rather than putting a nine month stay in it. Do you know, this nine month stay where the government after the recent resignation resignation of our, our, our Taoiseach is probably not even gonna last that nine months. If they had that conversation then and maybe started decriminalizing this and looking towards legalizing and regulating this, like that half a million a half a million could have been a stimul- stimulating the economy. That half a million could have been by legitimate businesses, people who mean to do well within society, who would employ people who, again, would further stimulate the economy with the wages they make, taxes collected from their wages. Again, broken record here to you good people out there. Um, you know this, but has to be said, I guess. <laughs> um, so three, three years in prison for this guy, a four-year sentence, one year suspended, um, backdated to last year, so he's got another two years there in prison. Let's let's hope, you know, in the next two years that Ireland will uh, see the light and form more progressive p- drug policies after other countries, much like Germany, who are set to do it next month, and we'll touch off that there in a little bit. But, you know, it's, um, it's sad. It's sad that uh, we weren't able to be a bit more progressive there only a month ago when the... Just, just the, just the tiny step. It was only decrim that they were talking about. You know that this guy still would have been liable to be criminalized, but at least maybe it would have been a, a, a in a society where we are much closer to retroactively, you know, releasing people like this guy. Anyhow, what are you saying out there about this? Boom, Ashley. What is happening? Ashley says, uh, "How many kilos?" Well, half a, almost half a million. So you had, what, 430,000, was it? 430,000. So you're, you're talking about, jeez, uh, five kilos, 20 is 100. So 20, 21 and a half. Yeah, 21 and a half kilos. That's what he got caught with there, thereabouts. But keep in mind, you know, the cops were the, the picking... The, the vacuum wrapping so the guy probably got caught with 20 kilos and there was probably a half a kilo worth of plastic there you know vacuum wrapping it keeping the smell in so nosy cops won't be able to smell it <laughs> oh lordy Teresa what are you saying says uh, shush <laughs> that's because you, you were checked in Spain uh, they were slacking uh, had a spare tub, uh, says Teresa. Uh, that sheet of piss was voted among us as the most popular. It came second as everyone's favourite at the table. I have to say it was up there definitely, but in my top three of the trip anyway. Um, that, that sheet of piss was... Uh, say, man, say magnifique. <laughs> I'd have to have a, a think about what else was there, like, you know, as, as notably, like, standing out. But that, that sheet of piss definitely, you know... The, the name really helps it kind of stand out too, Cheetah Piss. <laughs> uh, John Phantom saying here, just bought a low end 510 tread cartridge distillate THC vapes, 12 grams to 240 out of Florida Dispo. Look at you, John. Look at you. <laughs> you know, if you ship those things over here, that you'll be able to turn that $240 probably to, you know, uh, e- easy about fifteen hundred dollars. Easy, you you would probably get for each one of those uh vapes, like I- I'd imagine they're they're twelve one gram vapes. That's because that's kind of how they sell them here, one gram vapes, and they're selling them at about what what are they going from guys fifty to eighty bucks a vape pair. I I know I bought one over in Spain there for it was uh fifty bucks, um, but over here they definitely charge a little bit more at times. Z Cube was uh w- was fairly nice as well. Teresa actually had that one, courtesy of our buddy Joel. Uh, Krina, <laughs> Elijah and Avery are watching. Daddy, hi guys, hi Elijah, hi Avery. <laughs> no doubt Alexis is watching anxiously as well, waiting for me to finish up so she can get a lift. Ah <laughs> uh, yes. 
Um, who else is out there? Asher says uh, decrim and deschedule. Yep, one hundred percent. Yep, decrim deschedule. Uh, Rasher saying here as well, live rasm would cost a hundred. So, so they, there you go, like 1200 12, euro, you know, for 12 carts. So that's easy, fifteen hundred dollars given the conversion rate, I'd imagine. Ashley saying, uh, the disparity is incredible, uh, incredibly suspicious considering how little they valued Mr. Kyo's plants. Well, that's something actually we're going to touch off of here in uh, in, in the next case. Yeah, it is the next case. Yeah, boom, here we go. Um, so nice segue there, Ashley. Uh, much appreciated. <laughs> um, boom, oh, wrong one. There we go. <coughs> excuse me, excuse me. Um, so a man jailed for a half a million euro worth of uh, cannabis. Oh, apologies, apologies. This isn't the segue into the article I was looking at. Uh, there was another one here. There was, yeah, that's in a couple of stories time. You know what? We'll come back to this one. Let, let's jump to the one Ashley uh, was segueing into there, which is this. Um, so we go back here. Uh, um, a chimney sweep. This is the article I was uh, thinking that was next. Apologies. Uh, a chimney sweep caught operating significant grow house operation at a house in rural County Sligo. Um, and why I thought was it because he's the value of his plants were, were should have been up there. He got, like, this guy got caught with uh, forty seven cannabis plants, um, but as Ashley was talking about there with the uh, the Kyo case, um, that's the the case of uh, Uncle Tony as uh, as it was being hashtagged at the time. Free Uncle Tony, I think, was going around um, when the one of the uh, the family members of the the, the I would just say the the potato. Empire family here. <laughs> um, Kyo's crisps. Um, he got caught with a number of cannabis plants, but he was he successfully argued the value of a number of them based on the maturity down to I believe like two hundred euro per plant. I think is what we worked it out at in the end. Uh, the the court maintained eight hundred per plant for the mature plants, um, but apparently he had a number of very immature plants that he was able to get the value of down. Um, so in this particular case, uh, the the defense made a successful argument too to to get the um the value reduced or at least the uh, acknowledge that the the value should be less than what was stated by the the opposition the what would you call it? the prosecution there you go that was the one the prosecution um they, they use the word saplings rather than seedlings saplings you know saplings uh, I believe that's a tree. Um, towards a tree, a cannabis is a plant, it's a seedling, <laughs> seedling, sapling, may- maybe they're interchangeable, but, but I would have always seen sapling as tree, but anyhow, again, semantics, doesn't matter. This man, 54 years of age, before the Sligo Court, was charged with possession of cannabis for sale and supply, and also the cultivation of cannabis. Uh, the court was told it was only since he gave up cannabis he realised how harmful it was and this was another aspect of this story, actually, as I read into it, that really annoyed me. Like, this this guy, like, I, I, I don't know, is there truth to what he's saying? But I feel like there's not. I feel like he's just saying this, like, oh, he didn't realise how harmful cannabis was until he gave it up just to appease the court. You know, he's falling on the mercy of the court. And in order to do so, he has to, like, play out this charade that somehow the, the intervention of the justice system has like helped him in some way but it's 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 come on I, I i that's how i see it i don't know agree disagree out there let me know in the hot box but that's how i see it anyway in my own opinion um that this guy is basically terrified terrorized um into um playing out you know that uh oh cannabis was so bad for me i gave it up and now i see the light you know and it's only until i gave it up thanks to the help of the guards you know who were great um that I realise how bad it was for me, and I'll never do it again, you know? Um, yeah, like, and it does, actually, man. It plays into the propaganda then afterwards of the, the government, because basically they can use this guy's story, you know, as, oh, yeah, the justice system. Look how the justice system helps people back on the right track. It's absolute BS. Absolute BS. Um, but anyhow... Uh, the story goes on uh, that the man was charged with the possession of cannabis for sale and supply, cultivation of the plants that used cannabis, and also possession of cannabis at the same address. And I didn't read his address there, nor his name. Um, the the individual with uh, the state solicitor, uh, it, with Miss Mc, 
Hugh, state solicitor, prosecuted while Mr. Uh, Keto Grady, BL, instructed, um, so this guy's a bar, that's his barrister, instructed uh, by the defendant, appeared for the accused. Um, Detective Garda James Connolly outlined the evidence led by Mr. Mulroney. Jeez, they really waffle on in this article, don't they? The accused pleaded guilty to the possession of cannabis for the sale and supply. So again, you know, he's fallen on the mercy of the court. He's pleading guilty. Um, detective obtained a search warrant for the prop- property and McGowan was the only person at home. I wonder why they got a, a, a search warrant. Um, there were two rooms in the house converted into a grow house for cannabis. Maybe, you know, there was light escaping. Maybe the two rooms, you know, he was using a bit too much electricity. Set off an arm battles there within the uh, electricity company. Who knows? Um, but it says there it was a sophisticated modified grow house with no soil being used, just water and nutrients. So again, it was hydroponics. It was basically hydroponics, sophisticated. Come on, hydroponics. It's it's it's, it's, it's not very sophisticated. To be fair, like living soil, that's sophisticated. Um, and and meanwhile, you know, they, they would just say, oh, it's a simple cannabis grow or whatever. And meanwhile, the guy's fucking top of his game there living soil like couldn't be any more sophisticated <laughs> meanwhile this lad like sophisticated modified grow house is probably just getting a, a you know a, a bit of ph up and down modifying the ph watching the ec using the um the ec meter and just putting in a three-part nutrient mix maybe and do no more than that apparently that's sophisticated <laughs> uh, anyhow look anyhow um, the detective said they found 47 cannabis plants of varying stages of maturity. Uh, there were ca- there was ca- harvested cannabis weighing 57 grams and the arrested individual conveyed uh, to the Ballymote Garda station. Uh, the sergeant who was investigating said the amounts of the can was investigating the amounts of the cannabis. The harvested cannabis had a value of 20 euro per gram which came to 1140 euro. The 47 plants at different stages of maturity meant the valuations were on the potential yield as the market value could only apply when fully mature. Uh, the potential value was at €800 Euro per plant. Um, so this is kind of what you were talking about there just a second ago, Ashley, you know, the, the Kyo case. Um, the Kyo case, they made a very similar argument that the value was based upon the, the full maturity of the plant and that a majority of these plants were immature and uh, that was the same in Kyo's case. Um, and the court accepted that and they allowed a reduction on the valuation then, which meant at the time then for Mr. Kyoto, he avoided having to go to a higher court, I believe, and was able to be dealt with in a much more lenient uh, manner. Um, a similar is happening, thing is happening here. And again, you know, this this is given, you know, the man has to, to fall to the mercy of the court. Uh, he's been terrorised by the state uh, into, you know, making potential, you know, false allegations there against his... Uh, against the uh, the effect cannabis was having on him um, and the effect that giving it up has had afterwards too. But um, The Gerdy said McGowan, uh, oh, oh, sorry, we shouldn't have named the guy, uh, admitted fully cultivating the cannabis, the majority of, uh, uh, to feed his own addiction and he sold small amounts to a circle of his friends. He, uh, he said he had to, to cut down a lot of his cannabis intake uh, but he had been consuming a lot uh, the Garda detective said there was no gang involvement and he said he didn't know money and the individual was the only person involved. He said the Garda were satisfied that he had no assets gleamed. A number of photographs were handed into the court, obviously of the plants, of the property. Um, the the, individ- the defendant said the valuation uh, was fairly set out by uh, Sergeant Burke on the basis of €800 Euro market value for fully matured plants. The barrister, d- barrister said that uh, there were saplings there too and some plants were smaller. The Garda agreed uh, with this and he said that there were 17 mature plants and 30 saplings. Um, they, they don't talk about evaluation afterwards, which was unfortunate uh, because, you know, from that maybe you'll be able to, to determine what they, they value saplings at. Um, but anyhow, the, he agreed with Mr. Grady uh, that ma- the defendant had never been in court before or since and he attended the house in a very small rural area and there was full cooperation from the defendant. Mr. O'Grady said that at the earliest opportunity, his client pleaded guilty. Um, this man is not a player in organised drugs crime, he said. The guard agreed he was not your typical drug dealer. What is a typical drug dealer? Come on, to be fair. like I, 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 How many of you watched Weeds? You know, Nancy Botwin, a mother, stepmother, you know? Come on, like, what, what is a typical drug dealer? What do they look at? Come on, they're all, all shapes and sizes, all walks of life. There is no typical drug dealer what what he means here is your typical negative 
uh, view of a drug dealer. You know that this image of a drug dealer that they portray in the media that they're 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 violent, thuggish gangsters. You know that typical drug dealer. That's that's what he's trying to say. Um, but to be fair, drug dealers come in all shapes and sizes, all walks of life, and uh, I've met some incredibly uh, kind-hearted, generous drug dealers who would never rip somebody off, who would uh, never take advantage of anybody, um, and who would be incredibly fair. Um, and at the same time, I've met absolute scumbag drug dealers too. But to say typical, uh, there is no typical drug dealer. Um, but again, this is the, um, the stigmatizing language used within the courts, the justice system, and the media. Um, of people within our community. Uh, Mr O'Grady anyway said the detective O'Connolly was doing his job for a long time and he asked him if it would be highly unlikely to see Mr Mc, uh, the, the defendant in court again and he agreed. A number of references were handed into the court also. So again, like a lot of effort being made here by this guy uh, uh, to get out of the court. He said he had a large group of friends also and many of whom were actually in the court in attendance with him in support, you know. His doctor's report, he even went to the doctor to, uh, to get a report indicating that he had mental health issues and a difficult childhood. Again, you know, maybe cannabis was helping with his mental health issues. Maybe after going to the doctor, the doctor actually prescribed him some medication, which also helps with his health I- mental health issues and has uh, reduced the effect then of the loss of the use of cannabis. Um, and, and he leads a relatively isolated life. He developed uh, what Mr. Grady described as an unhealthy interest in the science behind the science of cannabis. That's, that's, that's again, you know what I mean? An unhealthy interest. Like, w- would you say that about my four years of uh, obtaining a, an honours degree in herbal science? Was that an unhealthy interest in cannabis? Where in that, in that period of time, I, I learned about the pharmacology there of, of cannabis uh, and how the different con- compounds, uh, the different cannabinoids more, more specifically, interact with our endocannabinoid system you know unhealthy like sorry no like but there's enough of that like uh he said in fairness to the garda uh that he was not a person on the radar of garda um and Mc- the defendant in evidence said he was born in bristol and moved to sligo when he was nine and a half he buried his parents in a short space of time and he had never married but had great friends he described his artistic background and said he had done stand-up comedy again you know very fitting of a person who might be using cannabis then, like, uh, to be artistic, to be, you know, engaging in stand-up comedy. Not not essential to be uh, a part of either of those communities, but certainly a common feature there um, for people within those communities, uh, artistic communities and stand-up comedy communities, which also, I suppose, is a part of the artistic community. Um, but the defendant put him uh, put it to him that if he knew the courts uh, doesn't view cannabis offences lightly. Also, uh, and the defendant replied that he would never have agreed uh, with what with that a year ago. But being off it, uh, my head is cleared up proper. So again, here's back into the shred that you know, oh, giving up cannabis and I'm, I'm doing so well now. Uh, he said he now realizes how addictive cannabis is. Uh, there is no arguments there. It is not a gateway drug, he said. You know, at least you know he 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 retained some sense of fucking um, common sense. <laughs> uh, at least you know he didn't join completely over to the prohibitionist way of thinking and be like, oh yeah, geez, and I was when I was using cannabis, I used to always use the cocaine. It was a gateway drug for me too. No, at least he he admits that it wasn't a gateway drug, which would much I was to the dislike of the judge. The, the, the judge probably didn't like him saying that it was uh, not a gateway drug, but um, he talked in Lint about some of his previous work in the arts and animation with his friends, and some of their stuff was brought, bought uh, for the set of the Kiln Scully uh, set, which he was honoured to have done so. Uh, and was that done at a time when he was using cannabis? You know, was cannabis so detrimental to this guy's life that it impaired his artistic abilities? Um, it doesn't seem like it did if his uh, stuff and his friends' stuff, if they were cannabis users too, um, was being bought up by the, for the set of Killing a Scully, which was a very successful uh, comedy here in, in Ireland on RT. Um, but anyhow, this guy also has a second job, working as a chimney sweep, you know? Again, the, the, the lazy, unmotivated stoner. <laughs> and, and the name of his chimney sweep, uh, or, or his little handyman business, is Bob the Cleaner. <laughs> I wonder where Bob comes from. I, I don't know. Oh yeah, I think his first name actually has uh, some significance there. Um, actually, yeah, isn't Bob Marley's first name Robert too? Actually, yeah, Robert Nesta, Marley. Uh, but anyhow, Bob. Uh, Mister O'Grady asked him about living on his own and if he is happy out there in his rural area, and he said that he plans to develop new ideas as a web designer. 
So again, you know what I mean? This guy is incredibly like motivated um, and cannabis didn't seem to, to impede at all, at least not, not from uh, what I'm reading here. Um, when he was asked if he had any intentions of repeating the offences, as in consuming cannabis, growing cannabis, he replied, no, absolutely not. <laughs> I'm feeling my ears now, he says, and it would be a great mistake to go back. Again, you know, he has to fall at the mercy of the court here to, to keep up this, this charade, to, to get leniency of the, the judge. And you know, I have to admit, he does, in fairness, in the end. Uh, he sent, said he wanted to pay tribute to the Gardaí, who throughout the investigation were very civil and very professional uh, Mr. The defendant uh, said it was, cl- or not, Mr. Grady, the the defence barrister said it was clear his client was a talented man, and if pointed in the right direction, again, you know, kind of insinuating that he's in the wrong direction because he was growing cannabis, because he was consuming cannabis. That's the stigma, like this, that's got to stop. Uh, but the judge said that uh, his position is the accused pleaded guilty on the tattoo accounts. The background of the offending was that the Gardaí conducted a search of his house where they found two grow houses. Two grow houses in one house. <laughs> Good, you know, it's like, come on, how can you have two grow houses in one house? It's like, what the hell? Two grow rooms, he means, you know. Again, this, this negative, trying to paint them in an, is as negative as a way as possible. Think about a grow room versus a grow house. You know, it doesn't sound as impressive if they, they bust two grow rooms. But now this guy has two grow houses. <laughs> you know? Like, you know oh, always the effort there to, to, to paint them in, in as be- a negative a light as possible. Um, there were 47 plants, 57 grams, total value of the cannabis, 1140 for euro. Um, the plants had a potential value of 37, but the judge said that he does not think they had a value, and he said the maximum was around 12,000 euro. And, and, and that's very interesting, 12,000 euro, because uh, if I believe if he goes 1,000 euro more, this guy had to face a minimum mandatory of a 10 years in prison had that been 13,000. I be- do believe that is the value in Ireland if you get caught with more than 13,000 euro worth of, uh, of drugs. Um, that you have to do a 10 year minimum mandatory um, I don't know that they combine the cannabis herb uh, with that 12,000 um, but anyhow with that one particular one you know, it's it's just an interesting number 12 it's like one short of the 13 <laughs> it was accepted he was not a big player and he was growing the cannabis for his own use uh, it was what he described as a cottage industry uh, he said that, uh, that uh, the defendant had given up cannabis and was much better and uh, Judge Johnson highlighted the damage, the damage drugs do to society, you know. Stop now, Judge. Absolute trash you're talking, dude. Absolute trash, because the real damage done to society in our own drugs is done by the prohibition of drugs. The, the prohibition of drugs which gifts the industry to, to criminals, to organised crime gangs, to, to very dangerous individuals out there who become incredibly empowered by the prohibition of drugs, um, you know. And, and and you're basically denying what is a, a perfectly natural thing for for a person to do, which is to seek an altered state through the use of um, various substances, which we call drugs, um, alcohol being one. <laughs> um, but anyhow, look, uh, he said the aggravating factors were the uh, the reasonably significant quantity, and it was going on for ten years apparently. So this guy was growing cannabis for 10 years. Never was a problem in society at all. Like, you know, he, only, he never came on the radar of the cops in that 10 years. Jeez, man. You know, it's, it's, the, the evidence here, like, is that the drugs aren't really doing damage to society. That, that like, it, this, like, just the uh, application of law on this individual has done more damage to society. You know, they, they've this guy terrorized. Um, they've now denied him his right to, to choose, you know, to use cannabis. Um, should he have wanted to give it up? He, that should have been a choice he made in his own without the infer- in- inference of the, the, the government, the, the authorities there. Ugh, anyway. uh, he was a reasonably law-abiding person whom lots of people like. Again, you know, reasonably law-abiding. Come on, to be fair. like He was, like, he was law-abiding. He, he, he was breaking an unjust law, which, again, if you, if you were to look at the quote there by Martin Luther King, you know, if the... If, you're showing more respect to the law by breaking an unjust law, especially, especially when a government are ignorant towards the harms caused by that law or the unjust nature of that law, which ours is. There's no denying now how ignorant our government are to the harms caused by the policies they stand over because you've judges like this say the shite uh, inciting these courts completely unchallenged and then you will also have 
pol- politicians, government ministers, like uh, go- government uh, elected officials, they're saying, you know, talking about junkies and uh, and all of this kind of crack inside in the dial, like, you know, using incredibly derogatory, stigmatizing language like that. Um, it really goes to show um, what where the damage is being done. And, do you know, it's not the drugs doing the damage, to be fair. M- much damage they are doing, it isn't the drugs that are doing the most damage. <laughs> Um, and that damage that the drugs are doing could be massively, massively reduced through regulation and legalization. But you know, ignorance, unfortunately, within government prevails. Um, so as I say, it's up for us, the people, to stand up. You know, which kind of what this guy was doing for for ten years. You know, t- empowering himself, um, growing his own cannabis. You know, not not uh, empowering some of the more. Um, we were just saying nefarious individuals out there engaged in the sale of uh, of cannabis um, because this guy, as it says here, you know, he was well liked within society, so therefore, like, he must have been a nice guy. He's not one of the bad ones, you know, he, he would have been one of the good ones who, you know, as Bob the Cleaner, he could have been Bob the Bloody Grower. He could have been growing the cannabis up there locally for the people up there in Sligo, should we not had these feckin' back da- backwards, outdated uh, policies of prohibition in place. Uh, the judge said he was impressed that there were so many friends there supporting him in court. Guys, keep that one under your hat, yeah? <laughs> Who's coming to court to support me? How many friends have I got out there? See April 17th, Cork City District... Uh, or, yeah, Cork City Court. <laughs> District Court down there on uh, Anglesey Street. <laughs> I think I, I, I might have too many friends for inside a court, maybe. <laughs> but um, the... He said uh, he he had led quite a life and was a talented in an animation and web design. He had a history of depression and anxiety, which had taken a hand on uh, on him, and his arrest was a turning point. Judge Johnson said he was impressed that there were so many friends there supporting him. He said that he had made a bad decision. It was primarily for his own personal use. He said it was at the lower end. Lower end, to be fair. Come on, the guy had 40 odd plants, guys, you know. Shout out there to the friendly grower. You know, dude, have a good look off this article. Send us your uh, solicitor. Uh, he he took into account the early plea and the lack of previous convictions. He said he was prepared to reduce a three-year sentence to 18 months and then ordered him to carry out 240 hours of community service instead of 18 months in prison. So again, you know, for, for this guy having what potentially could have been valued at over €37,000 worth of cannabis, uh, had that lowered to 12000 and then in the end, the judge gave him 240 hours of community service instead of 18 months in prison. Like, bravo, well done to that judge. Like, that's a great outcome for the individual. Like, I'm, I'm happy for that individual. And, and fair play, man. Falling on the mercy of the court, man, it, it played to your advantage if that's what you've done. If cannabis was so bad to you and giving her up, you know, has improved your life, then look, I do apologise for putting that those words in your mouth, if you will, or whatever. Um, but I do feel like, come on, it was a bit of a charade there. And like, come on, look at the outcome. Come on, it worked perfectly, you know, beautifully, man. If if that was it, hats off to you too. Like, you know, tip my hat there to the kid. <laughs> uh, yeah. But look, 240 hours. What's that? 240 hours. Um, boom, boom, boom. 24 hours in a day. So 10 days. 10 days worth of community service. Obviously, you won't do it in 10 days. Like, it's going to be broken up into probably 40 days, maybe, 8-hour days. Or that's, is that 30 days? Still, like, that's a lot of time. A lot of time out of a person's life for what? For growing some cannabis. for That he was growing for 10 years, never caused a problem in society, and, and was seen to be, you know, a respected member of of his community. So much so that so many of his friends actually showed up and attended court with him. Yeah, Miles Chronic, man. I 100% am with you on that one. Yeah, you, you say they call it an unhealthy interest. And I call it a passion. Yeah, I 100% agree with you there in that comment. Um, It is a passion. You know, the, the growing the cannabis, the people I know out there that are growing cannabis, like, uh, it, it, it's... <laughs> It's perfectly described as a passion of theirs. Like that is what they describe it as. That they have a passion for growing cannabis. Um, 
Ashley says, uh, but we all know different strains, different size crops, etc. Is all waffle, stay bullied. Uh, this man sounds like he was scared and justice system took full advantage. 100% Ashley, that's what it seems like to me when I read it the first time around, that this guy was terrified, he fell on the mercy of the court, he played, he, he sang their tune, he basically got their hymn sheet and he sang the words to the, to the tune that they wanted exactly as they liked. Um, that's how I see it. And it worked perfectly for him. He doesn't have to do any time in prison. He, he was going to get a three-year prison sentence off the judge. The judge said, look, I'll reduce it to 18 months and look, instead of giving you 18 months, you can do 240 hours community service. Because you're such a nice guy. <laughs> Friendly grower, there you are, my man. Uh, he says, the plants are like your kids. There there you go, it is. Like, it's such a passion. It really is. Like, even when I was growing other plants, um, strawberries and, and cabbages and things like that, um, like, that, that, that too, there is a passion. But I, 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 when I grew cannabis... Um, there was nothing like it. It's such an amazing plant. And I, I said this in our botany class back when, uh, you know, many years ago when I was growing cannabis when I was back in college. And I said this to our, uh, our, our, our lecturer. I was like, you know, in terms of uh, a plant that is really good for a person to learn about the growing of plants and the different techniques, like cannabis is an incredible one um, to learn about, like the different pruning and uh, all those kind of different techniques there. In training, because of how well it responds, uh, it's vigorous growth. It's like again at the end of the day. Remember, there is a weed. Um, I know there's like sensitive strains out there, but to be fair, like it's a weed. It it'll, it'll grow out your air if you if you fucking sit still long enough. <laughs> oh, that's a little bit cooler there now, yeah. Like that. Friendly Grower says, 39 plants here, all young, valued e at 800 each, so Kyo's case will help. And and also highlight this case, uh, Friendly Grower, because this is, I believe, at a lower court. Well, I think it's at the circuit court, um, but I do believe yours may, might be headed to the circuit court. Um, so it is referenceable there because they're in similar courts. Dublin Dave, what's happened, says, uh, I was just from not guilty of a section 15a plead guilty to two section trees and a section 17 um what, what's 15a again i know 17 is cultivation trees are possession 15a say, sale and supply yeah 15a imagine sale and supply i could be wrong Uh, Roman reporter says, got my barrister to tell the judge I'm still growing and won't stop and to leave me alone as I won't stop ever as so far so and, and so far so good. Good, good man. You know, um, I, I have to say, you know, I, I think just take, standing up, guys, taking that bold pro, uh, approach and, and acknowledging, you know, that it is your right, you know, that they're, they are denying you your right um, and that our rights come before these policies that are put in place by these uh politicians like if you, if you look like uh, uh, and shout out to uh b minish um you know one of the members over there on cran um he shared it there a good while ago up on his twitter up on his x profile um it's got a it's got the tr he's shared a transcript to the debate that happened all those years ago before they put the misuse of drugs act in place here in ireland and it was highlighted back then that hey guys you know is should we be concerned here about the powers we're giving the Gardaí? Are we not going to be potentially violating people's rights? Are we not overstepping here, you know, and, and potentially denying people access to a plant which has seen to be medicinal properties? All of this was said back then, and, and the government was just like, nah, 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 what are you on about, boy? You're, you're imagining things. Gone away, you hippie. Like, that, that's pretty much what they got away with. Do you know, and they could have slandered him. They, they could have said, you know, next you'll be, you be wanting us to legalise condoms, will you? And you'll be wanting the, the, the gay people to get together. Because that was the mindset of the people back then too who put these policies in place. And guess what, guys? Condoms are in every pub now, every bathroom uh, of every pub around the, the country. And, and it's not to promote sex at all. It's not so, hey, guys, get condoms, have sex. Woo! It's, hey, guys, if you're going to have sex, use a condom. Harm reduction, safer sex. That same goes for, for cannabis. To legalize and regulate can, can, cannabis, to have cannabis uh, cafes, social clubs, whatever you want to call them, um, in town, cities and villages across the country. It's not to say and promote cannabis and say, hey, everybody, smoke weed, it's great, you know. It's to say, hey, guys, if you want to smoke cannabis, well, here's a legal, regulated place to do so where... 
you get quality assured product you get a safe space to sit and consume it and enjoy it um, and you support jobs and stimulate the economy <laughs> and protect our younger population there too because uh, you'd have an age limit in place and reduce the uh, reduce the power of some of these organised crime gangs who fucking prey upon uh, young kids young vulnerable kids um, but yeah so there, there you go, uh, lucky, lucky ducky here in this case, um, getting off with uh, this, uh, getting off 240 hours uh, in my eyes is getting off with what he got caught with. So, well done. <laughs> yeah, in, in some degree, you know what I mean, man? Like, I, I, I can't say shame on you because I done it myself. I was there years ago and you know, terrified going into court thinking, oh shit, this is going to be terrible, I'm going to get a conviction, it's going to ruin the rest of my life. I went in there and I was like, yes or no, sir, three bags full, sir, I'm so sorry, sir, I'll never do it again, sir. I did that. But I was 18, 19, kind of doing that. I didn't really find my feet in the court, you know, and a bit of a backbone until, you know, a cup, like too many visits in there and just getting tired by the whole charade uh, that, that that pretty much is the court system. Um, because that, that was it, that's what it was as well. If I went in and said, yes or no, sir, three bags full, sir, with or without a solicitor, you know, I got the democracy of the court and I was able to put money into the donation to the charity box. I was like, man, this this is a con. I think I got that like eight or nine times before I actually eventually got a conviction. And I was just, once I got the conviction, I was like, right, the gloves are off. Now you gave me a conviction. I've nothing else really to lose here outside of my freedom, which, you know, are you really free in society if you have to bloody, you know, live in fear uh, 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 and, and not be able to have the, the choice there of what you consume? Like what, if the government in the morning decides, you know, you can't have tea for some fucking crazy reason, because that's pretty much what they done with cannabis, was a crazy reason, it wasn't founded in any uh, facts, <laughs> just crazy, like, I lost the word, bigotry. <laughs> wow. Um, so yeah, uh, yeah, I do too. Um, Alice Chronic saying hopes it works out go well there for your friendly grower uh, and and me too. And uh, April seventeenth, uh, my my own test case, I suppose, will be back before the court. Um, so, hey guys, how many how many of my friends want to come in and support me, <laughs> fight for my rights? That'll be an interesting one. <laughs> Who's talking about me out there, guys? We know I was getting mad at you. <laughs> Uh, Miles Chronic, uh, friend, friend of yours saying, here, loads of medical issues, so hopefully. Yeah, in fairness, um, don't don't be afraid, man. As as I said, there is, there's no shame, really, in you know, falling on the mercy of the court. Go in there, give him every sob story that you can give him. If you get out without your conviction and without a sentence, you know, happy fucking days. That, that's that's a win. You know, go for it. Um, don't don't be silly like that guy over there in Martin's world, you know. <laughs> Going pleading not guilty and fighting him. <laughs> Uh, quoting Bob Marley in court. <laughs> oh yes, has to be done though, huh? Clown world says Patrick Shields. It, it really, it is at times, you know, it's, it's run by clowns. But unfortunately, we we the people let the clowns run us. Guys, we have to stop. I think initially when, when say in Ireland, anyway, I know when we formed Ireland initially back when, you know, you had people who'd put their lives in the line fighting for independence and, and the liberated the country, you know, that these people had much... I don't know, much better qualities. They weren't perfect. They definitely had faults still, but I think over the years we just got weaker and weaker people in there as uh, the, the nepotism got stronger and stronger, you know? It looks, it looks like some Hall Martin. How long's he in politics? What's, is he in politics again? And what's your man fucking the, the new Taoiseach? Is it Slimy Harris? Wasn't, wasn't he the fucking water boy or something like that for Fine Gael? He started off as the water boy, I think. He was basically filling up the water, going around getting the tea and stuff, you know, for, for, for the Fianna Gaelers. I think that was Slimy Harris anyway. And he's now going to be our tea shock, you know what I mean? Just go for everybody out there, guys. <laughs> Even the water boys. <laughs> H2O. <laughs> Martin, what's happening? Uh, Martin over there on X says, hopefully Ireland and the UK will. Fingers crossed, you know, fingers fucking crossed there. Um, but I, I just don't know. I don't. I, I wouldn't be holding my breath anyway on the government doing anything anytime soon. Unfortunately, because I do believe the time is for us, the people. I'm very much inspired by what I experienced over there in Barcelona and Spain, and how they achieved what they achieved over there was the power of the people. The people stood up for their rights, and they fought for them through the courts. And that's why I was able to get on a plane, 
take a two and a bit hour flight there and go over and enjoy, you know, cannabis. Not not, not in a perfect environment. Uh, there were still clubs raided and stuff while we were there. Uh, again, we'll talk about that in the update. Um, but it's much better than what it was here. And the only reason they have that, um, that bit of freedom over there is because they got up and they stood up for their rights, as Bob Marley said. Get up, stand up. <laughs> Uh, Robin Report says, I thought the condom machines uh, was there so you could stash your drugs easy. <laughs> yeah, that's it, man. It's, it's it's not only for safe sex, but sa- sta- safe uh, stashing. <laughs> um, you know? Um, protect your insides there from any nasties on the outsides of uh, your baggies. <laughs> Oh, yes. Uh, Dublin Dave Fair saying that uh, the judge said he was looking for custodial, uh, looking at a custodial sentence, but I had a decent mitigation, lucky. Uh, but I had a decent mitigation and serious leg injury and wife recently had eye surgery and was dependent on me. Yeah, you see, that that's the thing. Uh, in my own situation, I, I would have not, not a very similar, um, as in like, a, I don't know, a serious leg injury, but I do suffer with epilepsy myself. Uh, which is a bit of a problem, but I also have my my partner, and we have four kids together, um, and yeah, certainly I wouldn't say she she relies on me. She she's a strong uh, woman in her own right, um, but there is times, you know, um, when uh, we do need the two of us there, um, because maybe she's not doing well, or maybe things are just getting fucking a bit uh on heavy because you know four kids, teenagers. <laughs> <sighs> Challenging to say the least, and I'll leave it at that for fear of um, oh, getting upset. Uh, Miles Chronic says, uh, I don't know, Ireland answers to the EU and Germany uh, run the EU. Things could change, yeah, yeah, things could change. As I said, Germany uh, about to change things. They're coming up very soon, very, very soon. Three minutes there to 4.20. And apologies to, to Alexis if you're watching. <laughs> <laughs> Told her I, I might be done there in uh, le- less than I might be done in just about over half hour. <laughs> uh, anyway, three minutes to four twenty guys. Uh, Spectre Hall says hello. Sorry for bothering you. I want to have promotions in your channel. Nice one, man. But no thanks. <laughs> Spam lots. Uh, uh, any hammers out there, guys? Hit hit that guy with the hammer there. <laughs> Ah. Yes, so uh, two two minutes and counting there, guys. I have all packed up. Um, so that is the case of the chimney sweep and the motorist. Uh, so we covered uh, two of those cases. And we have a case there of a man with uh, half a million worth. Um, and 3.2 million worth. There was significant seizures made there throughout the week, like in fairness to the cops. But guess what, guys? My ball is still packed. People are still buying weed out there. I'm I'm a member of a number of groups there on, on, on different messaging apps. Um and cannabis is flowing around the country. There there is no shortage there. There is no interruption in the supply of cannabis around the island of Ireland, despite what was described as significant seizures. You know? Um so fifty seconds and counting. Boom, we pop that up. So, as I say, you know, the guards patting themselves on the back, saying they're doing amazing, wondrous things, but... Guys, we, we know the truth. Come on. We know the truth. Like, how, uh, how many of you out there are about to engage in the second 420 here on 420 News? And the cops, you know, did very little to interrupt the uh, the supply of your stash. Guys, I'm putting in some of this uh, biscotti and Oreos uh, hash. Uh. I love how this stuff just crumbles. And then, oh, and then, oh, lordy. <laughs> it's just so nice, like, oh, I wish there was just a constant supply of this, this hash here in Ireland. Woo, happy 420, everybody. Yep, yep. But it would be great if there was just a constant supply of uh, of this hash, this uh, hash that's an isolator type hash. So again, mate, just use nice and water. Ugh. But when I have it, I just cherish it so much, you know. Just uh, knowing that every bowl I have of it is just getting closer to the final bowl and knowing that it's going to be so hard to replace it. <laughs> 
Um, this one, no, not not dry stuff. The Miles Chronic uh, did. This is uh, isolator hash. Um, so biscotti and Oreos isolator hash. Absolutely fire, man! Absolute fire. So here we go, guys. Uh, civil disobedience. Uh, let's let's do it. Yeah, the extra bit of water there went a the long way. Definitely improved the hit. flavors they're coming off of that thing like it actually it reminds me of uh <coughs> 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 what's that bloody um <coughs> is it bis yeah biscoff biscoff biscuits yeah bis is that what biscotti is as well is that like biscoff um i think biscotti is probably what more of an american thing is it uh, i i definitely not too familiar with biscotti Definitely no Biscoff, and that hash actually, as I was like, yeah, there's definitely a bang there of that Biscoff, but like not even the biscuit, but you ever get the spread, the Biscoff spread, has a bit more of a, a caramel bang to it, like or something. Holy moly, like jeez, <sighs> yeah, amazing. I wish, I wish I had my bang with me on the the balcony there over at the thing, and no offense to the monkey pipe, but. Uh, <laughs> That that poor monkey pipe got absolutely torched <laughs> in that dry sift sampling <laughs> uh, stage, um, and the isolator too. To be fair, um, who that that bong though you can't bait a good good bong like with a percolator too. Yum. Um, but the dry sift, uh, I I still have a little bit of the dry sift. They're actually miles chronic, um. So at least you know when that little bit of biscotti and oreos is gone you know we won't be completely out a little bit of dry sift there to, to go through uh saving the isolator or the not the isolator the uh the rosin the dabs um therefore when i get together with the guys uh hopefully soon and uh, we'll get a few dabs going <laughs> i think the dabs will be a bit more of a, a social thing that could maybe make our social thing turn into an anti-social thing <laughs> Everybody just sitting there, maybe uh, coughing up a lung, a lung, and then ten minutes later, absolutely monged. <laughs> uh, saying that though, my tolerance is probably still incredibly high since the um, the Barcelona trip. <laughs> yeah, so let's jump back into some of the news out there, you know, and. Uh, the next articles I want to get to, guys, um, it follows off of what we were just talking there. You know, the chimney, the end of that chimney sweep one there, the, what the judge was saying. You know, talking about the harms done to, in society by drugs. You know? And, and how I was talking there. You know, actually, it's not drugs that do the harm. It's drug prohibition that does the harm in, in reality. Because, you know, you, you look at the story that I'm going to put up next, and it's an unfortunate story it's it's i wish this didn't happen i wish you know policymakers engaged with campaigners many many moons ago um and that we had a legal and regulated drug market here in ireland and stories like this just weren't something that happened here in ireland um but this is a headline that was uh, from heron cork the story is out of um where armed Gardy raided the homes in cove um, after a man has died in hospital following a samurai sword attack. And like you might be wondering, you know, like what's this got to do with cannabis or whatever? But again, it's suspected that this individual pictured here, uh, who sadly, you know, uh, and rest in peace, uh, named Ian Bateson. Um, you know, he, he, he died on Friday after the, the, the fucking horrible assault. But it's thought that he had he known he, he knew his attacker that it was arranged to meet his attacker and that potentially he was attacked over a drug debt. that. That's what the story that's circulating, that's what's been said here within this article, um, that Mr. Bateson collapsed instantly after uh, he began bleeding profusely. Uh, this was after he was attacked, after he approached a man in a car who swung a long-bladed weapon at him, believed to have been a samurai sword, 
striking him in one of his legs and causing devastating injuries. And, like, I don't know if you know human anatomy, but in your legs, you got, like, a very important artery, I believe, down there. Um, And if this gets cut, uh, you lose, like, points of blood uh, from your body in, in, in a very short space of time. Enough time, like, where, you know, sadly, it's very highly likely that you lose your life. Um, His attacker had, uh, you know, what would you say? He had no fucking respect for life in, in, in you know, swinging a sword like that at another human being. Uh, but these are the kind of people, if this was potentially, you know, as it says here, the detectives are trying to establish motive for the attack with one line of inquiry focus on a possible drug debt. And if this was a drug debt, you know, this like, strengthens the arguments that I've always been making. And are these really the people that you want to leave under the con- in control of the drugs market? Because that's effectively the only outcome of drug prohibition is you're going to have these unscrupulous individuals who have no respect at all for human life not only will they swing a sword at somebody for you know for probably as little as 50 euro you know that, that was what uh peter condon uh somebody who share, ser, shares the same same surname and probably is related to me it's some some uh way i believe he's a uh, second cousin or something along those lines but he, he lost his life in glanmire in county cork as well also many years ago many many years ago when he was stabbed over what was a 50 pound debt i believe at the time could have been 50 euro, but I think it was 50 pound. I think it was that long ago. I think it was 99 um, when he lost his life, or maybe 2001. Um, those years are just ringing around in my head. Um, 50 pound. That's that's how much a life is, you know, to some of these people that we leave in control of the drugs market under prohibition. So again, pr- drug prohibitionists, guys, have a look in the mirror. Ask yourselves, you know, is it really worth, like, Keeping this going for how much longer? Come on, how long have you had your prohibition in place? It's not worked. It's only gotten worse. And it continues to get worse. Um, so this guy has lost his life. Uh, there, there's been an arrest since. Um, so there, the, the cops have arrested somebody. Um, I, I'm not going to mention a name. I, I did see a name. But uh, what has been described, and I don't believe this will affect the case in any way. Um, but the tattoo face, apparently is uh so so the guy who attacked him apparently is a guy who's got tattoos in his face uh apparently um and is like a known fucking scumbag apparently from from the area apparently um but again that's as much as i know um so i hope the guy gets fucking years and, and maybe life like because he took a life man it's, it's you know, i just don't i, I just can't see yeah, somebody sent their friendly grower saying that they, this guy who went on the run was found in, in Waterford. Um, but yeah, he deserves to be locked up for a long time, and, 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 and right, rightly so. Um, and again, the drugs market needs to be taken away from the likes of people like this who believe that this sort of behaviour is is appropriate, is tolerable in society. It's not. It's not, and, and, and it shouldn't be. And I hope he suffers, suffers badly and is locked up for a long, long time for it. Um, so again, rest in peace, condolences to the family of uh, Mr. Bateson. Um, sad loss for the community. Um, this guy, apparently, like John pictured here, he was out there running, uh, fundraised in that run. Um, but, you know, from what I've been seeing said online, he uh, was a nice guy. Um, didn't see anything bad being said about him anyway. But, you know, sadly, he has to lose his life because of these fucking idealistic prohibitionists out there who think that they can prohibit like uh, put a prohibition in place that's going to inhibit our desire to to use drugs that's going to quench <laughs> it's you know the desire there for certain individuals to, to use drugs and for other individuals to to make a profit off of the demand there for these illegal goods <laughs> it's it's laughable like it's laughable but um and yeah yep prohibition fuels gangs violence exploitation of young people and uh drug debts yeah 100 percent it does it does indeed it's it's ridiculous, um. But they're they're going to continue it, and 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 there's another one. Like you know how how bad it gets, like drug prohibition. Did look at look at the madness again. You know outside of a guy getting caught caught with a, a the dead, I suppose pretty much with a samurai sword, you, you had a kidnap victim, getting kidnapped up in the north of Ireland and then transported across the border down into the south of Ireland, um. Again, believed to be some way connected to to the drugs trade, the illegal the illicit drugs trade. Um, but get this, all right? The cops rescued this guy. Uh, like the armed guardie had to rescue this kidnap victim. Rescue, uh, this kidnap victim. 
Um, they, they found him like in in the car with uh, I do think it was a two or three others. Uh, the others were arrested. They found a weapon in the the thing. So like he he was held on at gunpoint. Um, the cops put their lives at risk to rescue this guy. And then to hit, read the headline. Then M fifty abduction victim refuses to cooperate with Gardy. <laughs> He refuses. They rescued him now, keep in mind. Like, they rescued him. You know? Uh, and they put their lives on the line in doing so, but the detectives believe the man bundled into the car in Belfast was about to be murdered by the gang. Um, it says the man whose life was saved by when armed Gardaí officers intercepted the car he was being uh, held prisoner is uh, in, in the M50 is refusing to cooperate with the investigation. He's 35 and from Belfast and apparently is facing serious charges in the north of Ireland in relation to organised crime offences after being charged with being involved in the supply of cocaine and amphetamines. So again, like, you know, that, that part of the article straight away, man, alarm bells. I'm like, this guy was like either like going to rat on him or he's already ratted on him or he owes a hell of a lot of money and he's not able to pay it. And the easiest thing to do with him is just to... You know, off and bring him down to the south there, bring him down to, to some unmarked location and pop on in him, bury him in an, in an unmarked grave and back up then to the to the north. Madness. Like, but this this is what's going on. This is what drug prohibition fuels within society. Like this this judge there earlier in the case, you know, talking about oh the harms of, of drugs. And he's talking about cannabis in that case too, keep in mind. But come on, look at this. The harms of drug prohibition. Maybe not talking now will keep him alive in the future. 100% Roven Reporter, man. You're on the money. That's exactly what this guy is thinking. He's like, I can't talk to the cops here. He's like, I can't. They're, they're not going like, no They're not going to be able to help him. There is nothing the guards are going to be able to do to help him. Like, is if he talks to them and rats on the other guys, the other guys are just going to get him anyway. Again, you know? Um, they're not going to be able to, to, to protect him. There's a, do we have a witness protection <laughs> thing in Ireland? Like, is, is there? Do you know? Come on, like we're not American now, in the, like in the movies. <laughs> I know we do it for like pedophiles and things, apparently, um, but I don't think we're going to do it for uh, drug drug dealers, <laughs> druggies and drug dealers. <laughs> wow. But uh, armed guardies stopped the BMW on Dublin's M uh, Dublin's M fifteen near Ballymun at around ten p.m. on Thursday night, and it's believed the matter is linked to organised crime and that a South Dublin gang may have ordered the man's abduction. A strong line of inquiries that the man was about to be murdered, and detectives are investigating whether the gang had outsourced the abduction to a gang of four male criminals who were still being questioned in North Dublin guard stations last night. The suspects are all aged in their twenties, and the uh, Three had been living in Galway and the other in the Clondalkin area of the capital. One of the, the Galway-based suspects is, being, is a convicted drug dealer who served a lengthy jail sentence after being caught with a large amount of assorted drugs. Uh, the, again, you know, this, this again just supports what I said as well a few minutes ago. You know, the, the, the nefarious type of individuals who will end up uh, benefiting off of the, the prohibition of drugs and in control of the, the trade and the supply of drugs who would have no problem at all in preying upon individuals, taking advantage of vulnerable individuals. You know, this, I, I, all of these articles, it's funny when you'll be reading these, it's just like, just always just evidence reinforcing my, my arguments um, that I'd be putting forward. And, and and it just further eroding the notion that it's drugs that do damage to society when in fact, like it's drug prohibition that's doing this real damage as we can see here. Uh, the Clondalkin based suspect who's uh, 28, Previously lived in County Kildare and has convictions for assault in a Garda and a number of others. Do you know, like, again, further strengthening the idea that the people who get involved in drugs because of the illegality of it are not nice people. This guy is no bother even assaulting cops, like, you know? Come on, like, you're, you're really pushing it there. Like, he's no bother assaulting a cop. Like, uh, think of how your poor son or daughter is going to stand a chance against uh, a scumbag like that should, should they encounter him out there. If they're unfortunate enough, you know, to come across them. What is believed that at this stage is that the individual who was abducted in Belfast had a very lucky escape and it's understood the victim is on bail in relation to charges in the north and he was not ab injured. Uh, again, yeah, he's on bail. So again, you know, they're probably worried that the guy was going to rat or maybe, again, they, they have information there that he already has ratted. Um, but, you know, maybe the fact that he's not 
cooperating with the cops here that's kind of supporting you or maybe, maybe that's like a double play like maybe the cops are saying he's not cooperating he's actually sang like a canary to him and they're saying he's not cooperating to try to get the boys off his back and saying oh yeah he didn't rat look look he won't even work with the cops down there sure <laughs> who knows um that's really going out there on a limb now <laughs> Uh, he was not injured in the abduction, which uh, began a number of hours earlier in Belfast when he was bundled into the car at gunpoint. Um, so apparently it was seen up there of him getting uh, bundled into a car at gunpoint and the Gardaí responded after the PS9 provided them with the details of the vehicle. When the Gardaí carried out the interception of the vehicle, they found a firearm in it and the Gardaí Shikana continued to as closely with the PS9 um, said a guard spokesperson and before the arrests were made the Dublin Road Policing Unit had sent out officers to set up checkpoints and search for the car so again you know much needed guard resources there as well being diverted away all because of this needless situation created by potentially just drug prohibition if you think about it is this going on for alcohol most likely not you know, most likely these guys aren't involved in the sale and trade of alcohol because that's not very profitable. Sale and trade of drugs is incredibly profitable. Incredibly so. <laughs> oh, what are you saying out in the hot box? Sorry for waffling on going, getting through those articles. Oh, what, what do you think about that case? Uh, Martin saying here, yeah, prohibition fuels uh, gangs, violence, exploitation of young people and drug deaths. Keith saying they don't care about the Irish people. The government, that is, yeah. Yeah, they certainly don't. And, and nor do some of these organised crime gangs too, you know. Um, I, I Myself, personally, I, I would love to be able to set up locally uh, a cannabis collective of, of sorts, cannabis cafe, call it whatever you want. Um, have it a not-for-profit type of a model, if you will, something that would benefit not only the, the cannabis consuming community, but the wider community around that location. Like I would love to be able to set up a club where the the proceeds that the, the members you know put towards you know the production of the cannabis for them, um, and any extra money that's left over there at the end of the the month the year, um, could be used to better the club, but also better the community around that club. You know, may, maybe making local uh, donations towards local kids sports clubs, charities, things like that, instead of what is what we're doing currently. <laughs> like what we're doing currently is. We're making criminals out of good people. Again, you know, the friendly grower out there, the guy only wanted to, to grow some, some plants for himself, uh, was got a bit carried away because of just how Im- impassioned you became. Am, am I right? Am I right, uh, friendly grower? Just because of how impassioned you became, you, you got a bit carried away. You grew maybe uh, a few more than what um, it, the, the cops would look fondly upon. <laughs> I don't think you had him as many as your man though He had 47 there in that last case I think you said you did 39 wasn't it Or, or somewhere in that number, region um, But yeah It's shameful what they do man It really bloody is um, People like yourself again the friendly grower It's in your name and you're the friend, you'd be the friendly grower If you were able to do what you wanted to do there locally But in your community Won't, won't mention uh, locations at all But man you'd be an amazing uh, An amazing contributor contributor there within your own uh, locality uh, much, much like other people I know out there but unfortunately you know we, we have to you know, be, be ashamed of ourselves uh, stigmatised by the media the, the justice system we, we have to accept that I say no I say if we get up we stand up guys we stand up for our rights and if I have to go to prison for, for standing up so be it uh, at least I know I'll, I'll, I'll have stood up and I'll have done what I do believe is right can't turn my back on that. Uh, Scanner says, obviously he's scared for his life co- co-oping. Uh, we'll only get his death sentence sped up. Uh, serious organised crime, that. Yeah, you see? It's true. I, I, I don't disagree with you, man. Cooperating definitely wouldn't be in his uh, interest at all, that is for sure. Roven Reporter says, must be plenty empty uh, shops needing rent from a local club. Roven Reporter, man. Uh, do you know when I, I take a trip there, just... I'm going to go five minutes down the road. You wouldn't believe the amount of places I'm looking at, man. And, and they're just slowly becoming more and more dilapidated. Some of them are still in good standing, but they're just idle. There's one place there, and it is absolutely beautiful. It's a beautiful location. It's uh, it's 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 lo- located right next to... It, it's called Keaton's Fitted Furniture. Some people in Aaron Cork will know it. Um, I've no problem saying it because it's just stood there idle for so long, but it would made, make an amazing little cafe... 
has beautiful space and it has a lovely upstairs space too where you'll be able to accommodate a, a couple of grow tents uh, to grow for the members uh, who could consume nicely downstairs and it's conveniently located then next to uh, the Glen River Park where which is a lovely walkway, has uh, a lovely uh, little lake down there, has ducks in it and again that place, that place could you do with an, a, a major cash injection to go down there and clean the, the bollocks out of it um, sorry, um, but really, like it really does need to be cleaned. I go for a run down there quite, uh, quite often. Um, and it's it's a shame that the the lake isn't what it used to be. I I can remember going down there as a kid and going fishing in that lake, catching little roach and stuff like that. Um, good good fun. But now I don't even think there's fish left in there anymore. The thing is just overgrown. Um, but the whole place has become overgrown. It's been very underkept, but. A little bit of a cash injection there for maybe a local club, yeah, man. That could locate there in that the idle building that stood there now, idle, empty for the last, I would say, easy ten years. I I, I want the cre- I think keeping for the furniture there and where on just the road not not far from me is about ten years empty. So so you're not r- wrong there, man. Plenty of empty old shops in in all towns, villages, cities all across Ireland and pubs, pub pubs are falling. Pubs are really falling because the the government are killing them really with with the overtaxation on them, the the cost of living there and everything. Um, but pubs are dying a debt, unfortunately. So there's a number of pubs there, then, fortunately, <laughs> uh, for clubs. So do guys definitely guys get your heads together locally with people and just kind of look uh, up some empty buildings and you know if you can make it happen, make it happen. Uh, if you need assistance, if you need help, advice in any way, I can certainly uh, help try to help guide you in, in any way shape or form uh, keep in mind I'm not legal uh, a legal expert or anything but I do know a thing or two about uh, clubs and what the Spanish did and stuff like that so uh, more than happy to chat <laughs> Robin reporter if you build it they will come yes they will yes they fucking will and then some I think I think the problem would be keeping them away afterwards wouldn't it <laughs> Oh uh, yeah, so so there we go. Like like the, those that case there, like the those two cases, uh, one man uh, uh, killed, you know, but because of potential drug debt. I mentioned there another case, you know, uh, an 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 old one, um, also from Cork, where a man was killed over a, a fifty pound debt, um, and a young man at that, I believe, uh, he was only bloody nineteen, I think, at the time when he was killed. Um, this man here killed was thirty two, a young father as well, guys, a young father. Sad, very sad. Um, and then the kidnap victim, you know, not cooperating. <laughs> How much more of this are we going to take? Like, come on, seriously. How much longer are these judges going to get away being able to say that drugs are doing the damage to society when, come on, guys, is is it weed? Am I am I, am I smoking too much weed? Am I seeing this wrong? Because. <laughs> I'm not the only one who sees it this way. Oh, yes. It smells lovely. It's not the cheetah piss, though. I'm just saving that nugget cheetah piss uh, for, for a good bu- for a smoke with a good buddy. Um, Bobby says, I'll be on the first flight available if that goes down. Bobby, I will keep you posted, buddy, as soon as uh, we, we have a date set when, once there's a location. Um, yeah. But I, I do know that there's definitely efforts being made uh, by different people in different locations. It's not just uh, it's not just myself now who's uh, looking at stepping up the the civil disobedience game. I am tied up on court, uh, uh, although, but that won't hold me back. <laughs> Might slow me down, but won't hold me back. Even Stevie Wonder can see what's going on. Spot fucking on, friendly girl, my man. Even Stevie Wonder can see what's going on, guys. <laughs> JBs, what's happening? It was just in Portugal, man, and they had some 90s looking shit. <laughs> what do you mean they had some 90s looking shit? Like some, some old school soap or hash, was it? I hope you didn't get ripped off like I did. <laughs> I got stung there, man. Got me good, dude. Sold me a nudge on the street. Burnt uh, a nudge that smelled good. And then gave me an edge that wasn't what he burnt. Silly me. 50 quid though wasn't, wasn't the end of the world. Uh, Miles Crying says, check out the lads from Real Gorilla Seeds in the UK. Amazing outdoor work. So there you go, guys. 
real gorilla seeds in the UK. Uh, I'd imagine they're over on Instagram, Mal's Chronic, yeah? Um, so check out what they're doing, guys. Get a bit educated on gorilla growing, which is outdoor growing, if uh, if that's your thing. Um, but if indoor is your thing, then there is, geez, endless amounts of uh, people you can go to to learn from. But I would definitely suggest uh, Temple Grower. Uh, he's over on YouTube. And uh, Greenbeard, uh, who is on Instagram. Um, both of those guys have got some great content up there, some good guidance. Um, then the guys, geez, there's, there's so many. The guys over in High and Home growing. Um, you know, you, you've got the Growcast. <laughs> With Jordan and Gang, MB Sanchez. Um, geez, there's so many. So many out there. A shout out to MB Sanchez if he's out there. Um, it's been a while. Hope you're all good. Uh did it boom. Martin saying here coffee shops, uh clubs would be good for selling cannabis. Yep. Indeed they would. Double Day says, even if found guilty of manslaughter, they would probably get a lesser sentence than the mandatory 10 years for growing a bit of weed. Yeah. Thanks for the heads up. Sorry, Lexus. <laughs> Apparently, I guess that was going to happen. Mr. Wells says, uh, Buzz, or, uh, sorry, Buzz, Bud Lightyear. <laughs> Bud Lightyear did that at an event, had bags that smelled amazing and gave out something else. The old bait and switch, never using him again. Shame. Shame. Bud light here, guys. Avoid, yeah? I will take Mr. Uh, at his word. Um, so Bud light here, guys, uh, is definitely to be avoided. Does the old bait and switch bait you in with a good smelling thing and gives you something that ain't that good. <laughs> um, but what Bo Miles Chronic says, Real Gorilla Seeds is here on YouTube. So there you go, guys. Real Gorilla Seeds on YouTube, not Instagram, as I said, mistakenly. Instagram. Nope. YouTube it is. <laughs> um, boom. Right, I got the heads up that I can kind of take my time now. <laughs> we have uh, two, two more articles there just to, to dive through with you guys. Um, we hit the motorist one. We hit the chimney sweep one. And uh, th- th- there was a guy caught with a half a million worth, actually. We, we've actually got well, th- these ones on the seizures. Half a million worth of cannabis. It was stored in insulation pallets. Um, so this guy showed up to collect them and apparently he showed up in a rental car. Um, but the rental car was too small for the cannabis uh, that he was supposed to be collecting. Um, and apparently he got busted by the cops then when he was coming back out through the Dublin Port Toll Plaza. And that was on July 5th last year. Uh, gives his name here. He's 30 years of age and is a Polish native also like uh, one of the other cases there mentioned earlier um detective garda patrick uh, told the prosecutors that the offense came to light after the detective dog found the drugs at a logistics warehouse in county dublin customs and excise officers were searching a warehouse uh and in raccoon when the dog indicated the presence of drugs in a consignment the consignment was brought back to the customs in dublin port where concealed cannabis was found uh, cut into 10 insulation sheets the following day, an employee in the logistics section received a call from someone with poor English who needed directions to the warehouse to collect the insulation pallets. So they set them up. They, they had a sting um, and a guy fell for it. A staff member gave the man the air code and when he arrived, he signed for the consignment and produced a false Polish ID card. Not a good start for this guy. The man the accused uh, was then told the insulation pallets were seven foot high and wouldn't fit in his Tucson uh, hatchback. Uh, he replied that he would take what he could now and come back for the rest. He managed to fit four insulation sheets into the car and was later interrupted by Gardy at, uh, at the Dublin port. Gardy searched around the car and found two iPhones with Dutch numbers and an Alcatel phone. Alcatel phone, I'd imagine that's one of the old, kind of like your burner phone type of things. Um, not a smartphone, anyway. 14 packages of cannabis worth 200,000 were found in the car and the remaining 300,000 of drugs uh, were discovered in the warehouse. In total, that there was 25 kilos of cannabis found. Um, he gave his correct name and address and said his ID was fake, but his passport was real. He told the guardian on arrest that he'd arrived in Dublin 10 days earlier from Brussels and that the iPhones were his. He said he was not under pressure or in fear, adding, no, I'm not afraid. Um, CCTV footage from the Dublin airport showed him picking up a rental car on July 6th um, and he's no previous convictions, uh, the court was told. 
Uh, the Garda agreed with uh, the Dermot McGuinness uh, defending that the accused was lower on the chain of culpability than others involved and had effectively been transporter of the drugs. Mr McGuinness uh, said that the individual deeply regrets uh, his involvement and although he was not necessarily aware of the full scale of the operation, takes full responsibility for his role. Again, just falling on a bit on the mercy of the court there. Uh, he worked as a chef in Krakow and his mother, sister and fiancé wrote letters on his behalf which were handed into the court. The court heard his mother is seriously ill and unfortunately for this guy, Judge Martin, Martin Nolan was on his case. Ouch. Ouch. Um, and uh, he said that this guy was a vital cog in the wheel but had no record and was unlikely to offend so he completely disagreed with him being low on the chain. Um, but and instead insisted that he was vital cock in the wheel. And to be fair, look, the judge, it's his opinion that matters at the end of the day, not the opinion of the defence or the cops. That's you. Um, he described the accused as a good family man and noted that as a Polish man with a limited English, he will find it harder in an Irish prison. And the sentence was backdated to the July uh, 5th last year. Excuse me. Um, so like they they are back uh, so five and a half years in prison in total again eighty thousand a year so you're talking over thirty thousand there for the cost uh, thirty thousand sorry three hundred thousand uh, is the cost there um to the Irish check uh, taxpayers uh, you know that that's a lot of money to lock up this guy instead you know we could be locking up you know, the pedophiles out there the murderers you know, the 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 fucking people taking advantage of. Uh, uh, of all sorts of vulnerable people, but instead, no. Um, so there we go. Uh, five and a half years backdated to July last, uh, f- July fifth of last year. Yeah, just having a look. Uh, Keith Allen says Polish takeover. Elijah and Avery are watching as well. Says uh, says Krina. <laughs> Hope Avery. Uh, is she in there saying, ouch? <laughs> um, what else being said in the hot box? Load of hellos for Wes. <laughs> good, that's good. Uh, another article I have for you there, guys, and it's another significant seizure, as I was mentioning earlier, and it was uh, 3.2 million euro worth of, uh, of, of cannabis. Um, this was uh, a bus that was made up on the M50. So it should be up there on the screen fee. So the Gardaí arrested a man in his 50s following a seizure of 3.2 million worth of suspected. Suspected because obviously all of this all of this cannabis, all of these drugs that I've talked about here so far on the show, all have to go for testing. You know, Again, further cost to the taxpayer. And that's a cost outside of the 80,000 per year per prisoner. You know, that that's a separate cost. Um, testing all of these drugs. Um, so three point two million worth of cannabis. Again, you know, three point two million, which we could have taxed and employed people to sell. Instead, we're wasting precious resources of Gardy, um, out there, um, making the lives of people just miserable. <laughs> Uh, a man has been arrested after the Gardaí sees 3.2 million worth of suspected cannabis when they stopped a the vehicle on the M50 in Blanchardstown in Dublin 15 yesterday. The man aged in his 50s is being quizzed at a Garda station in North Dublin after uh, 162 kilos. Whoa. 162 kilos of suspected herbal cannabis was discovered during a Garda operation. Uh, the the Gardaí attached to the Garda National Drugs and Organised Crime Bureau had intercepted and searched the vehicle at approximately 5pm as part of an ongoing investigation targeting organised crime activity under Operation Terra. I forgot about her, actually, guys. Terra. Operation Terra. <laughs> She's still going. I think she ends this summer. I think she comes to an end now this summer, Operation Terra. And and do you know what they're going to do now? They're going to parade the results, guys. You know what the results are going to be? Just a bunch of numbers. A bunch of numbers, and the numbers are going to be a success, apparently. A success, my arse. During the course of the search, 162 kilos of suspected cannabis uh, was seized. Uh, the seized drugs have an estimated value of 3.2 million, and the uh, seized drugs will be sent to the Forensic Science Ireland for analysis. 
The Gardaí added that a male aged in his 50s was arrested in connection with the operation and is concurrently detained pursuant to the provisions Section 2 of the Criminal Justice Act uh, 96 at a Garda station in Do- North Dublin area. Uh, investigations apparently are still ongoing, again, for a cost, you know, to the taxpayer. And Gardaí added that the seizure forms part of Operation Terra, the Enhanced National Anti-Drug Strategy, which was launched by Garda Commissioner Drew Harris in July 2021. The focus of Operation Hera is to disrupt, dismantle, prosecute drug trafficking networks at all levels, international, national, local, involved in the importation, distribution, cultivation, production, local sale and supply of controlled drugs. Because you know the only important thing to the, 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 the focus on here, control drugs. They're anything but control drugs. If if we actually control them through legalization and regulation, we would achieve all of this. We would disrupt, dismantle. Uh, we wouldn't prosecute, I suppose. We wouldn't prosecute. We would disrupt and dismantle, so we wouldn't achieve the prosecute part. Um, now, uh, yeah, all levels, international, national, local, if we were able to achieve, you know, maybe a global uh, legalization and regulation of of of, uh, of drugs. And yeah, I suppose even we could still prosecute drug trafficking because there'd be still illegal drug trafficking. There's still going to be people who aren't going to be wanting to pay the, the taxes of government, you know, much like people sneaking fags into the country there and stuff like that, like cigarettes, in case people are insinuating I was on about sneaking gay people into the country at a time when it was illegal to be gay, huh? <laughs> I wouldn't use such a derogatory term towards the gay community. <laughs> uh, but people have said it before, though. <laughs> Um, so there you go, Operation Terra, still up and running, man, it's 3.2 million, what a, what a shame, what a waste. All that cannabis had to be grown. What a waste. It has to be burnt now, it has to be destroyed. We, we could have done that for them, and we would have paid for the privilege to do it. Imagine that, like, the, the government now are going to pay to burn this, to destroy it. We we would have bought it, we would have paid to destroy it for them, and enjoyed doing it. <laughs> oh, good Lord, when you think about it, when you actually think about it. Uh, Martin says we've uh, had 52 years plus of drug seizures. Has this won the war on drugs? No, it hasn't. It hasn't, Martin. To answer that simply, it hasn't. And it never will. We can have another 52 years of it. The only way it's really going to work is, you know, is if when you're born as a child and they implant you there with, like, fucking Elon Musk's Nordlink thing there, and then they hack you. Yeah, they hack your brain. And they go into your brain and they, they go into your, your, um, your, your natural, what would you say, uh, reward system your natural desires as a human, and they will just turn off the desires to alter your consciousness. They turn off the desire there to seek out drugs, you know. They would just turn you into pretty much a robot then at that point because at that point, you know, you're not look, you're not going to be allowed to smoke fags, which, you know, for hell reasons, you probably shouldn't anyhow. But again, it's your freedom of choice. You should be allowed to choose to smoke fags if you wish. You know, shame in New Zealand what they're doing, you know. They're outlawing it. That's, that's backwards. But anyhow, drink, you know, they're going to, Take away your ability to drink as well at that point if they, if they do something like that. Would you really accept it? You know, prohibitionists will tell you initially, like, ah, sure, you've nothing to worry about. Sure, it's for the protection of your own child. Sure, you hardly want your child to be doing drugs anyway, do you? Most parents would say, no, sure, I don't. Yeah, that, that might make sense then to some fucking absolute lunatic parents out there before you know it. Like, you've got an absolute society full of zombies. Again, I'm going really out now a limb there. Look, fucking, I don't know if you can see the tin file under there, like. <laughs> but potentially, like you know, that that's one direction society could go if we were to, to give in to this fucking prohibitionist mentality, like that. Your desire to use drugs is unnatural. It's unhealthy, as described there by the other dr- the judge, to even just to study it. Oh, there we go, it's finally cool enough to get a good slug off it. Um, Rasher says, all those numbers affected the market or maybe a, a month or two around Christmas, which actually proves what they're doing isn't working and we can not uh, We can work those numbers into our arguments. 100% Rasher's. Um, and, and to be fair, I, I, I would argue Rasher's, and I don't know if you'd agree or disagree, but I, I think some of these seizures, especially when it comes to like October, November, I think they play in the interest of certain individuals out there who will sit on an amount of cannabis there until the Christmas period, knowing that at the Christmas period the stuff is going to sell like hotcakes, like no matter at all, man's going to fly off the shelf if you got some. <coughs> the demand is high. Um, but when you have a number of seizures, then 
it creates this like artificial uh, image that like there's a shortage. But look, if you're a, a lad who's just sat on a kilo or two, you can now just take advantage of the market. You can now sell that kilo or two, man. You just stick it into a fancy bag, call it Cali, and people are going to start giving you three and a half grams for a hundred quid because they're desperate. And it's Christmas as well. Maybe they might even give you a hundred and fifty for the three and a half grams because it's Christmas and it's your sure art to treat. I know Cali is normally a hundred for three and a half, but sure, it's Christmas and there's a shortage, isn't there? I've heard that before from people. I've heard people saying, "Ah, oh, yeah, but sure, there's a shortage." Like you see that seizure. So like yeah, like I'll pay seventy for a fifty bag. <laughs> it's like what? <laughs> Absolute lunacy, but that's what goes on. So I don't know. Agree, disagree, guys. Uh, do you think seizures actually play into the to the hands of uh, dealers who would take advantage of the market in that in that sense? Sell something for more than what it's actually worth. Then you know, double their double their fucking uh, profit for the same effort. I suppose. Goes on. It definitely goes on. Um, so the, the last uh, seizure that I have for you before we uh, kind of move on to something a little, it's it's somewhat more positive but the final seizure before we get on to that somewhat more positive news is that there was 18,000 euro worth of cannabis seized in Tipperary um, one of the guys shared this in the, the hot box and another one asked you know is how in the name of God is this 18,000 euro worth of cannabis come on look at it look at that like if that if that's all of it like they're they're Inside in each one of these bags basically is 200 grams. So they got 800 grams of cannabis here. Um, because one kilo is worth 20,000. So therefore, like, you know, they, they got 200 grams here in each bag. What, 18,000 though? Like, stop, lads. Seriously. So like, w- would you pay 4,000 for, for 200 grams? You wouldn't, like, not, not, in, not in a lifetime. Maybe maybe because there's a shortage. <laughs> Uh, but the Gardaí arrested a man seized approximately 18,000 worth of suspected herbal cannabis following a search operation that took place in the uh, Boris O'Kane area of County Tipperary on uh, the afternoon of Saturday, March 16th. Uh, the man who is aged in his 40s has since been charged and appeared before a sitting of uh, Nina District Court. Uh, and as the matter has now appeared before the courts on Gardaí Síochána, cannot provide further information. So again, 800 grams worth of cannabis. Uh, your man's name hasn't been released, thankfully. Uh, his address either hasn't been released, but no doubt they'll, they'll probably get around to that when he's back in court next time. Um, but is this is this benefiting society? Come on, this guy in his 40s. Like, is, is, like again, we're going to hear it in the case like later on is this guy has never been in trouble before probably, is is an upstanding member of his community, you know. he's All his friends show up in court, much like the other guy, you know. How many nice people get dragged to court, you know, hashtag free... F- Patrick Moore, come on, enough already. I'm sorry, guys. I'm like a broken record on here, just ranting about this stuff. I really do feel like a broken record, but unfortunately, until things change, I'll continue. I suppose to have to fucking be a broken record. Ah, the cost of living in a broken society, I guess. Ah, uh, Dublin Dave, is it? Double D, is it later? Dublin D. <laughs> Good luck, Dave. Yep. Dublin D. Double or Dublin Dave is Audi. Catch you later, Dublin Dave. Nice one for uh, checking in and gracing us in the hot box, dude. Um, but it up, boom. Dinner time. Yeah, catch you later, Martin. Nice one. Not a bother, all Dave. Twenty k for a kilo. What the fuck? Yeah, I know, man. Isn't it? It's it's yeah. That's Dublin Dave saying that there. Uh, eight, eight grand was what I used to pay for a kilo back in the day, and I got that tick. Come on, I, I got that tick. Um, so if you're going to be able to pay cash, you're easily going to get a kilo probably for like six or seven grand maybe. Bobby's asking, what am I smoking? Bobby, we are blazing... Um, what are we blazing actually? This is the uh water watermelon skittles. There we go, watermelon skittles. Uh Martin saying here uh, a lot of young people get sucked into dealing drugs precisely because of prohibition. It is, and and look, you want to talk about a gateway? Well, 
prohibition and cannabis, you know, the prohibition of cannabis is the gateway, unfortunately, for a lot of young people into the life of drug dealing, into the world of your typical drug dealer. Do you know what I mean? If you were to use that, like, you know, to these absolute scumbags who think it's okay to use a sword. And, and that guy, unfor- like, fortunately, sorry, fortunately, is not your typical drug dealer, as I said. I, w- I would say I met more nice drug dealers than I met bad drug dealers, I have to say. Um, but definitely as a younger person, I definitely met some of the more dodgier ones. You know, there was definitely people I met as a young person when I bought a bag off him. I was like, right, I'm not buying a bag off that dude again. <laughs> not going back down there again. Um, but yeah, like uh, I think like the prohibition of cannabis is a gateway and it's a gateway for vulnerable. And that's, that's the key words there, vulnerable young people. It's not all young people, not all young people will fall prey to this, it's the vulnerable ones, and they're the ones we really need to be looking out for, to be fair. Um, And they'll only be protected through, again, as we mentioned, legalisation, regulation, taking away the control of the market from these individuals who will prey upon these vulnerable young people, you know? Ah. You all know this, you all know this, like, uh, there's what, 32 of you out there watching, and I can guarantee that if I was asked, how many of you agree with what I just said? 32 probably yeses, no doubt. I'm um, preaching to the choir. But I suppose the whole the whole point of me doing this, guys, is just to, again, to remind people, guys, this, this is our rights. This is our rights that they're taking away. And the only re- reason they take them away is because we allow them. And in allowing them, not only to take away our rights, we've allowed them then to put our young people, our, our, our young kids, in a much more vulnerable position, you know? Ah. Bong time, I think. <laughs> Ah, touchy subject. So, uh, blaze this one to legalization and freedom, as always. Ain't no prohibition getting in my way of doing that. Ooh. But there certainly is other things, but uh, we'll, we'll try to be strong and we'll try to get through this and uh, continue in this campaign. I'm not going to step back anyway, no matter how tough things get. <laughs> so, slant at everybody out there who engage in that civil disobedience and who might join me in the future. Civil disobedience. Ah. Final story feed in today, guys. Uh, you know, after after going through all of this, you know, um, the final story um, is looking at Germany. We mentioned that there earlier that we will be getting to Germany. Germany is uh, due to legalize and potentially regulate cannabis there um, in April next month. Um, what's that? Six, seven days away. Seven, eight days away. First of April is eight days away. Let's say Monday week. Um, and that's said to be the day that uh, Germany is going to decriminalize cannabis over there, um, where German citizens are going to be allowed um, to possess, I believe, 25 grams of cannabis in in public and 50 grams at home in private, which, again, I, I believe uh, that's a bit incredibly restrictive because they're allowed, I think, grow three or four plants. It's like, how are you supposed to have 50 grams at home if you're allowed to grow three or four plants, but... Anyhow, it's it's definitely a step forward. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what happens there in Germany. But uh, there there was rumblings there recently that uh, you know there there was going to be trouble for this policy um being put in place for it to actually to, to cross the line and um, to be enacted. Um, but it seems like those uh, worries have been allayed now and put to bed. You know that those fears are no longer um in place. Um, so the article goes into it a bit more. Um, uh, maybe uh, are you out there uh? <laughs> uh, sorry, um, Steph. <laughs> um, but yeah, you you're probably more aware of the the German scene than me. Um, boom, there we go. It's up on screen now. Um, so this is an opinion piece by a guy of the name John Dolan, and again, you know, you, you might as we read through it, kind of see a a little uh, indicator of this guy's position you know um so says so all eyes in germany is as concern grows over cannabis laws 
Um, and uh, that, that again, the concern grows over cannabis laws. Like, <laughs> the, the concerns have been put to bed. Um, there, there was concerns being raised, but the concerns have been addressed, you know. Um, but he doesn't highlight that in the article. Um, but he, he does continue to, to highlight the concerns. The concerns grow. <laughs> Um, it says, Germany's descent into Nazi domination in the 1930s has be- bequeathed it is a, as a lawmaking process that is uh, slower than that of many nations, decentralised and aimed at trying to build a national consensus rather than a winner-takes-all approach. As a consequence, up until a vital twist yesterday, Germany risked losing a plan to decriminalise and move towards legalising cannabis um, but in the end, uh, one month after the lower house of parliament, the Bundestag backed the move on February 23rd, the upper house of the Bundesstrat, uh, which represents Germany's 16 regions, backed off from the, a threat to impede it. Um, this German news came as other EU countries, notably Portugal and Netherlands, appear to be rethinking liberal drug policy experiments. Again, you know, there's, there's nobody really rethinking it. There's talks there in Portugal that... Uh, of maybe putting some policies in place to um, control open drug use that's going on in certain parts of society, uh, maybe putting in place regulations to reduce the 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 risk of people using drugs openly outside school in in their school areas or something like that. Um, that's not them rethinking their 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 liberal drug policies. That's just them strengthening the regulations. That's just them being a bit more uh, s- sensible. They're they're not thinking of putting back in place like criminalizing people for the possession of drugs um, but they're certainly putting in place maybe fines or something like that to deter people from using those drugs in places like schools which makes sense we have that pretty much here in Ireland like you know if you're caught with an open can of beer on the street like uh, you get fined um, in certain places uh, certain towns and whatever allow you um, but in Clark anyway um, you're certainly in the city you're not allowed to drink uh, openly on the street um and you know, I don't disagree with that I suppose to some agree, to some point uh to some level <laughs> it's certainly annoying when you're trying to leave a pub down you have to down your pint like that see the negative uh, consequences of it um but yeah um but Irish advocates of change especially in relation to of a, to a greater tolerance of soft drugs will watch such diverse developments carefully a bit like a Shannon versus the Doyle this is um so for those of us there in Ireland um, that's the comparison that they're making to the um, the Bundestag and the Bundesstrat. The, the Bundesstrat. Um, so that's like the Shannon versus the Doyle. Germany's federal upper house has limited powers on the framing of national national laws, which mainly focus on delay. Um, and the Bundesrat has powers when it comes to the regional financial burdens that could affect the provinces, and that was the issue at play here. A provision in the National Drug Liberalisation Scheme is for a retrospective amnesty for people convicted under the old laws. Um, And the powerful province of Bavaria, where the sister party of the main opposition Christian Democrats opposes drug liberalisation for many reasons, argued this retrospective amnesty could put undue pressure on legal and and police services with many old convictions reopened. So they're worried, like, you know, that... Undoing uh, old convictions, freeing people who were locked up under the old law that they're going to change is going to create too much work for them. But they weren't worried about like trying to keep the law in place and keep locking people up, you know. It's like, come on, look at the time that they're going to save. Surely a little bit of that time can be used towards undoing the harm of the old laws, as they're, they're referring to them here. Um, he says his focus all this past week has been, uh, oh sorry, this was seen as a potential device to overcome the upper house's lack of direct power to block the drug law, but the federal health minister, Carl Lauterbach, um, was determined not to give up on his flagship initiative. His focus all this past week has been lobbying to prevent the bill from being referred to the mediation committee in the Bundesrat. Um, this will be because negotiations in the committee could drag out the process, meaning the bill might not have been finalised before the next federal election in autumn 2025. Such delays could have effectively killed the drug legalisation as the opposition CDU may well be back in the driving seat from next year onwards. Frederick Morris, the CDU leader, has vowed his policy, or his party, apologies, will reverse the legislation if it wins those federal elections next year. Fingers crossed that doesn't happen. 
But again, when they're when they're admitting here like that, they're going to undo the legislation if they get elected. Surely that's not going to play in their favor when the legislation's due to come into effect, as it says here in April first. Um, and that reversal could actually be a very difficult thing to achieve, because they're talking about freeing people from prison, undoing convictions given to people under the old law. And um, what are they going to do? Come back and say, no, no, those people have to go back into prison. Those people have to be convicted again. Come on. Uh, the new laws will allow people 18 and over to possess up to 25 grams of cannabis for personal use for both the other coalition partners, the German Green Party and the Liberal FDP. The legislation of uh, ca- uh, legalization of cannabis was a key election promise in 2021. Much like our Green Party here in Ireland, wasn't it? And they effed us over on that one, didn't they? Unfortunately, but Mr. Lauterbach counter appeals to every state co-governed by the Socialist SPD and the Greens to prevent the death of the measure and he was exultant the threat was averted. The, uh, to convince the wavering states, Mr. Lauterbach sa- had said the federal government would address some of the concerns of the states. Yet at the same time, Portugal's 20-year-old experiment of switching to drug abuse focus from criminalisation to harm reduction continues to come under pressure. It doesn't. Talks about the COVID pandemic, uh, ensuring rece- ensuing recession has uh, spread the open air use of drugs. So again, it's not the policy. It's not the policy. It's th- like it's the pandemic that caused the open air use of drugs. It's not the policy. So why would they undo their policy? Um, uh, referring here to Porto, the the second city of Portugal, um, having called for law changes to clamp down on open drug use in their schools and hospitals. Again, law changes. Again, that's just probably putting in place like a fine for people found to be using. Uh, drugs in our schools or hospitals or, or maybe given the, the cops power to remove people from those areas or something along those lines and, and then give them a fine if they're, they're found back in that area or using drugs again afterwards, who knows but it's not undoing what the, the progress that they made um, it's actually making it a bit more progressive if anything to be fair uh, similarly in the Netherlands where cannabis is decriminalised and tolerated rather than allowed many people now see so called drug tourism as a growing problem, no they don't Authorities in Amsterdam have banned cannabis smoking on the street in the red light district and cut the number of drug smoking coffee shops by 40%. You see, that, that, that there's the problem. What, the, what they did in Amsterdam, they didn't actually cut the number of drug smoking coffee shops. What they done is they increased the, uh, the distance in which they had to be from schools and, and, and they include, like, a, if you're in English college, if there's an English college there, like, a, that's a school. And coffee shops weren't allowed to open near them. At least this is how what I was informed. I want the correction on this, but that's what I was told is that uh, th- those sort of uh, colleges, English colleges, were re- regarded as like a school, and therefore any um, coffee shop that would have been in range of one of these, especially after the uh, increase, the increased range, um, they had to close. Um, that was a good number of years ago, though. That that was fucking Jesus. Going back like nearly ten years ago, they started doing that. I think it was. When they increased the range, the distance in which they had to be from schools. Um, but again, look at Amsterdam now. They're actually legalizing it. They have legal sales there. They're not they're not doing away with drug tourism. Drug tourism is only really a problem there in, in, in Amsterdam, if if you will, um, because of prohibition in other places again. Like it's it's not a problem caused by cannabis, it's a problem caused by cannabis prohibition in places like Ireland because people like me then will hop on a plane, as they did to Barcelona. <laughs> as I did fucking 11 times already to Amsterdam <laughs> it says across Europe we appear to be headed for a period of confusion he says about how to manage the undoubted problems associated with drug use again again failing to highlight and recognise the problems associated with drug prohibition it's like you know and as I said you know you'll get a hint here of this guy's position he's definitely like a supporter of prohibition in my opinion um, agree, disagree, but what's his name again? Um, John Downing. I believe he's a prohibitionist anyway, uh, after reading this. Um, he says, against that trend, the reversal of liberal approaches risks enhancing criminals' opportunities. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I definitely think this guy is, uh, is a prohibitionist after that final comment from him. Um, so what are your thoughts out there on this? What are you saying in the hot box? Uh, Bobby was asking, what am I smoking on, Bobby? Um, oh, I got back to you, actually, didn't I? I said uh, it was the watermelon Skittles. My favourite broken record says Dahi. Nice one, Dahi, man. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, Barry Field says, just rolling between the... F- Floor moppings. Go on, boy. See what I mean? 
motivated, uh, hard working stoners out there. <laughs> I sense bah, nice one, nice one again, I. <laughs> Keith saying, and why we can't we all come together? Uh, Keith, man, that that's what I don't understand. To be fair, you know, um, I, I know I done what I did that that year during the COVID pandemic, and maybe that was a reason not for people to come and join. But to be fair, I'm back in court on April seventeenth. Uh, I've I've no problem in. Uh, if there was a mass civil disobedience protest, let's say April 20th, like I, I shouldn't get locked up on April 17th, but April 20th, I know the guys in Dublin are thinking of doing something, um, but I don't want to take over their event um, and, and be fucking, you know, labelled as whatever, but we could do something in Cork, we could do a protest in Cork, and I mean a proper protest, uh, just march and a smoke up, but we march, you no, know, we march too. We we march to Anglesey Street and we, we, we take over Anglesey Street, maybe. Uh, I know we always done it at the Peace Park, but uh, I think the time, you know, for like the Peace Park, <laughs> not the time for peace, we'll keep peace in our minds, but the time for the Peace Park is, uh, it's gone uh, because obviously it's it's been renovated at the moment. Oh, we just missed 420 there as well, guys. Uh, happy 420 there to the people, wherever it was just 420. We'll blaze on in a sec. Um, but yeah, the Peace Park, we, we used to go back and have a little thing at the Peace Park um, and then probably we went to a pub and stuff before when we used to actually do our marches there. But I think maybe, just thinking out loud now, uh, maybe a march from the Peace Park to Anglesey Street, a march finishing on Anglesey Street and a smoke up outside a courthouse at a guard station and maybe like a crowd demanding, you know, a day in court. I I I would have no problem leading that. Um, in in some sense, I know a cop once came and told me, you know, that if I encourage people to break the law, that I'm breaking another law. But I I, I don't know that law, so I'll worry about that. When it comes to being charged, <laughs> um, but certainly I think um, I think yeah, I agree with what Keith's saying here. Uh, we all need to come together, guys. That's the only way we're going to overcome this. I have no faith in our government. I've said this once. I've said this fucking a hundred times. To be fair, I have no faith in them. I don't. Well, well I always campaigned because I, I I had no choice really but to have faith in them. I was always campaigning and hopeful that the policymakers would enact proper policy and make proper changes. But man, they're they're ignorant bastards. Like they really are. You know. Oh, let's pack another ball. So, guys, uh, that was the final article there. We just finished off with the Germany thing. Uh, oh, one, one final thing I wanted to bring up. The John Dowling. You know your man there, John Down, Downing. Downing. This is his ex-profile. And, and you know, like, I, I wanted to call him out a little bit for this because you see in his profile, I don't know if it's legible for you out there, but Irish independent writer, okay? Uh, Ron Fer- for Terry, uh, or Niji, um, I, I definitely butchered that Irish word, uh, politics, jazz, okay, he has jazz there, and he's hurling rubby, guelga, and more, opinions looted from far and wide, are occasionally my own, but jazz, guys, he has jazz there, that's, that's, that's one thing I didn't get, I was like, does he not realise, you know, how rooted cannabis is in jazz? Like, well, well, I can't remember again who it was. Um, was it Nina Simone? Um, she talks about the muggles. Is it Nina Simone? Or am I mixing her up with somebody else? Um, uh, it was the word used for, uh, like, non-magic people in Harry Potter. Um, J.K. Rowling apparently whipped it from a jazz musician, like, you know. But th- that was actually the word used for joints, apparently, by the jazz community. You're going to, you know, go, going to smoke some muggles. Well, hey, there, you know. Mad. But I wonder, did John know that? Huh? John? John, let's have a chat. <laughs> Calling you out, John. <laughs> Do you really love jazz? <laughs> jazz salad. <laughs> oh, yes, jazz salad. Love it. Keith, Keith saying here, blowing smoke up their own holes. Yeah, Do you know. Yeah. Uh, come to get. Mm. Not one person going to do it. Yeah. 
Yeah, Miles Cronick saying I'm optimistic about the, the Germany and the knock-on effect of that. Yeah, I'm very optimistic as well about the knock-on effect that Germany is going to have on, on Europe at large. Like, you know, consider the fact that um, Germany is such a big player within Europe, you know, if they go ahead and, and, and legalise... Uh, like, what they're doing at the moment is just regulating... Not, sorry, not regulating it, apologies. They're just decriminalising it um, and they're, they're regulating it. But they're not regulating... Like, are, are they, like they're, they're allowing social clubs social clubs can sell up to 50 grams to a member in a month so that to me like it's it's not it's not like it's not an open market is what I'm trying to say I suppose they are legalising it in a sense they are regulating it definitely over heavily regulating it you can only buy 50 grams a month Um, you can only have 25 grams in public so obviously you can only buy 25 grams at one go maybe at your, your club um, you're not allowed to consume it at the club either is another one of the rules you have to buy it there and take it and leave um, That I think that's similar to Malta as well um, but yeah yeah Roven Reporter there even actually better again better historian on jazz than moi muggles was actually the term used for people who smoked weed in the jazz area in the jazz era I, I'm mistaken, he said it was used for joints. Muggles were the people, apparently, who smoked the, um, smoke it, the, the wacky wacky. <laughs> and it was Billy Holiday. Yes, Billy Holiday. Yes, nice one, nice one. Barry Fields is there with the save. See, guys, don't, don't be taking your history from me. I was always terrible with history. I could tell you the story, like, somewhat. <laughs> I was always terrible with dates. Um, yeah, bad with names as well. Good with faces. <laughs> it's like I know your man, just can't think of his name. <laughs> and I was always like that long before I consumed cannabis. Before anyone tries to insinuate, ah, see, so look. <laughs> so everyone in Harry Potter smoked weed, and some wizards too. Yeah. <laughs> <sighs> Dumbledore uh, like the old uh, pipe, Piper hit or two <laughs> Boom Another ball pack there on you guys um, So yeah that is All of the 420 news um, the, the two stories I really Wanted to highlight though were those Horrific ones well that, that horrific one Where a man sadly lost his life And then the other one where a man potentially was about To lose his life you know th those two stories um, were important to highlight there again because like that's the more extreme side of it in terms of like people's lives being taken you know or potentially being taken um, you know the use of guns and all of that stuff like that really needs to be highlighted that it's not drugs doing that that it's drugs prohibition and, and like nobody wants to be living in a community where that potentially could be going on because where, where were those guys going when they came down to Dublin Do you know to a community near you I would hate to be, you know, next door to, to that house, you know, or wherever it might be, um, or or accidentally, you know, come across these guys while they're they're doing something that they shouldn't be, and then you, you know, un un unfortunately become a victim. I remember there was a case there as well, mistaken identity in Limerick, uh, famous. Um, I don't know how famous he was actually, but he was a rugby player. Uh, mistaken identity got shot. I believe that was in the. The, the Dundon um, feud that time. I can't remember who they were feuding with. Uh, did, was it the Dundon and uh, the London feuds? Jeez, I can't remember who they were feuding with. But like your man, mistaken identity. It was They thought uh, he was somebody else. Had that had a hit in him. Hitman went up, 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 killed him. Next day they find out actually, no, that was the wrong person. That's some innocent bystander, you know, someone's son, rugby player, you know, someone's teammate. Many people's team, you know, rugby team. And that happens. And still, you know, still today, prohibition prevails. That happened many years ago. When when did that happen? Just, just out of curiosity, before we blaze that ball, you know. Like, quick Google search there. Almost 16 years. Yeah, Shane Gogan. Shane Gogan. That, that was the name there, guys. Gangster John Dundon accused of a cynical ploy. 
Um, so almost 16 years after innocent rugby player Shane Gogan was shot dead in a case of mistaken identity, the Limerick gangster who ordered the hit, John London, has been accused of a cynical ploy after he sacked his lawyers and asked for an adjournment of an appeal against his murder conviction. And guess what, guys? Guess what? It's mad. This is only three days ago. This was actually only three days ago this case is up here. That's mad. 16 years later. Crazy. And that's still going on in court. There's the article. There's your man John Dundon. John, uh, John Dundon. Who's been accused of this. Like I know I said I was finished uh, the 420 News. But like guys come on. Like Jesus. Like that's still going on. 16 years later. Like the, the, the family. The, go, the, the Gogan. The Gogan. The Gogan. Sorry for butchering that name. Uh, sorry name. Uh, but do you know what? The Gahan. Is that it? Gahan? Shane Gahan? Or Gogan? Jeez, I'm trying. Anyhow, do you know the, the his family is still not got justice? Do you know that's what I'm trying to say? Shameful, man. How long has this article? Let's have a quick browse through it. After the, uh, the, the Court of Appeal granted an application for Dunnan's lawyers to withdraw from the case, Dunnan told a three judge court. Uh, he discharged his lawyers after discovering last Tuesday that they were unable to advance a ground of appeal that had been identified in recent months. Dunn said he did not want to go into detail about the additional ground of appeal, but said it related to things that were not disclosed to him ahead of his trial and that he was told uh, did not exist. But he is now in a position to prove it did exist. He said he had instructed his legal team to raise the ground of appeal but decided to discharge them uh, when the claim he was told they hadn't done it properly. Sean Guerin, for the Director of Public Prosecution, said Dundon was engaged in a cynical ploy and that he'd use a similar tactic at his trial in 2013. Council said disclosure was carried out in full and the Director is adamant it can meet any complaint regarding disclosure. Mr. Gairn said the director is anxious to get on with the case and the deceased mother who had attended every, every court date wants to see an end to this matter. Keep in mind, guys, you know what I mean? This, this, this mother, you know, her son, died needlessly because of uh, a feud and drug crime gang family, the Dundons, you know, with another crime family, uh, you know, whoever they were, um, that were empowered by drug prohibitionists. So it wasn't drugs that done this. It wasn't the people using the drugs out there. You know, it's the drug prohibitionists they're trying to do an unnatural thing, and they're trying to like fucking put a law in place to to stop what is a a natural behaviour where that the harm really like is just on the user only if they were to abuse the substance, misuse it, um, and that quite often happens in an un- in an unregulated uh, environment. Uh, more often happens in an unregulated environment that doesn't than it doesn't in regulated. Um, Mr Justice Patrick McCarthy said Dunnan had gone through several sets of uh, competent lawyer, lawyers and that the latest dismissal must raise an issue of good faith Mr Justice John Edwards presiding granted the application for an adjournment but warned that Dunnan must instruct his new lawyers at the earliest opportunity and they must uh, complete all necessary paperwork by April 8th the appeal hearing will take place on April 22nd and Mr Justice Edwards said the court will not entertain any further applications for adjournment bring it, bearing exceptional or unforeseen circumstances. Dundon was 41, formerly of uh, Hyde Road in Limerick, was convicted at the Special Criminal Court 2013 of ordering the hit that killed the 28-year-old Mr Gyohan, uh, Gyogan uh, near his, the, the victim's home of Clanmore, uh, Kiltara, uh, Dora Doyle on November 9, 2008. Many years ago, he and still, you know, our policymakers can't get their heads out of their arse on this one. He is serving a life sentence. Uh, Mr. Gohan played rugby for Gary Owen in Limerick and had been watching an Ireland national game at a friend's house before heading home shortly before 1 a.m. He had just texted his girlfriend uh, to say he was on his way home when uh, she heard shots being fired outside the house. Uh, Mr. Gohan was uh, shot five times with a Glock semi automatic pistol. The fatal shot was to the back of the head. It was the state's case that Mr. Gyohan was uh, the unintended victim of the shooting that was meant for another man and was ordered by Mr. John Dun- Dunnan. Um, key prosecution witness April Collins gave evidence that John Dunnan ordered gunman Barry Doyle to kill the other man. Doyle, 38, admitted during guard interviews that he shot Mr. Gyohan in the case of mistaken identity. However, Doyle of uh, Portland Row in Dublin 1 later pleaded not guilty at the trial to the murder of Mr. Gyohan. Um, he was found... 
guilty by a jury at the Central Criminal Court and was given a mandatory life sentence by the Justice uh, Garrett Sheehan on February 16, 2012. Jeez, at least that Justice Garrett Sheehan did something fucking right. Surely you could have got him for a bit more. Conspiracy for murder or some shit, man. Fucking taking money for murder. Give him another life sentence. Another one for that. <laughs> um... But yeah, there you go, like, uh, geez, what are the chances? I, I, only, I uh, genuinely only brought that up just because that case was familiar to me at the back of my head. I, I wasn't even there to coming across that. It's it's mad to see that still 16 years on, um, Shane Gohan's family have still not got justice. That's sad. really is a sad reflection on reality. And still, you know, policymakers bury their head in the sand as the effect of prohibition in society. Still, judges can talk about you know all oh, the harmful effects of dro- drugs, but the prohibition. Come on, look look at it. Like a man, like won't uh, to his girlfriend texting her. I'll be home there in two minutes. Love, turn on the kettle, bang bang. She hears it. Do you know? Horrible, horrible shit, man. Jimmy K, what's the best way to contact me privately? Um, but up up um X, uh, Instagram, Facebook. They're all there. Get me on Telegram. But that'd be it. Good few options there for you. Uh, Dahi Golan says, give, uh, give me champagne when I'm thirsty and give me reefer when I want to get high. Mighty, muddy waters. The lyrics. Yeah, there you go. Like, um, cannabis is definitely entwined in uh, so much jazz. Um, especially the jazz from back uh, in that era. Yeah, Roman Reporter says Prohibition kills. Yeah, that's a hashtag that I, I, I've been using for a long time. Uh, prohibition doesn't work. Hashtag, you know, hashtag Prohibition kills. Uh, it's a very old term, unfortunately. Too old. Says Roman Reporter. Dahi Golan uh, says Louis Armstrong loved his spliffs as well. Yeah, you know what I mean? And that's a person who people would have no problem with throwing his music on in their kitchen, you know? I know I happily sing along to his songs anyway, but... <laughs> Uh, yeah. Uh, 13 minutes there to the next uh, 420 holy moly does that mean we we done 3 hours did we no 2 and a bit <laughs> oops oh yeah that's right because this, this hour has uh, 420 twice in the 1 hour remember that's what it was this is a special hour guys <laughs> Um, Jimmy K says, so not a bother all, Jimmy K, man, you're more than welcome. You are uh, more than welcome. I think, uh, yes, I do. I have another bowl of that uh, lovely uh, watermelon skittles packed up there. <laughs> oh, so, yes. Um, what are you all saying out there? Ha, <laughs> Sorry, I was just having a quick fl- flick into the uh, share from Simon Harris has been announced as, yeah, yeah. Simon Harris being announced as new leader of uh, Fine Gael. Been announced there recently. Like, it's mad what's going on here in Ireland, guys. If, if people are paying attention at all to politics, uh, I know a few of you aren't based in Ireland, but... It, it the the rats are jumping like the the ship that they, they see it's going down. There's a num- numerous uh, politicians here in Ireland now, um, after announcing they're not going to contest the next election. Uh, watermelon skittles from Ted asked Bob. Uh, no, uh, no, I've had the watermelon skittles from Ted and it was lovely. Um, and uh, not this 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 one is from uh, someone more close to home, <laughs> a local grower, um. But yeah, there, there's a number of politicians, especially I think it's on Fine Gael, uh, there's a number of them after like announcing, no, no, we're not running next election. I don't know, like, you know, and again, you know, to put, like, see, there's a tinfoil hat on there a little somewhere. Um, I wonder what's coming down the line, you know, there, there's a lot of, I don't know, talks there, speculation, that shit in the Middle East, like shit with Russia and Ukraine, shit with, like, the tensions going on there with the US, um... And is it Iran, um, you know, with the Israel-Palestine thing, you know, that all of that fucking whole thing, 
but it's just waiting. It's just a catastrophe waiting to happen. Like you think it's a catastrophe, no, and it is. It's fucking a hell of a catastrophe. What's going on there in both places? Needless loss of lives in both places when people could have just sat down and fucking talked. But man, is it going to get worse? Are these politicians jump, you know, announcing now we're not running the next election because you know they just want to focus on their own family, get their shit ready because. Uh, what was that they need to have their go bag ready? <laughs> Build their bunker. <laughs> Who's building bunkers, man? It isn't your man um uh fucking Facebook Zuckerberg uh building a bunker and the whole lot like <laughs> Sorry, uh we're we're just finishing off a little fun one there. Uh and we got another ten minutes there for four twenty, so I just said I'd have a little uh a little fun chat. Oh, cause I wonder, like why why did Farad Kirk quit like why did he up and leave? You know, things in the Middle East could fucking spiral out of control. You know, um, the US could get sucked into either of those. The Iran could get involved. These are all potentials. I hate to think about them happening, you know, and the potential outcomes, uh, the the consequences, the fallout of that. Like, but jeez. Like, will, will cannabis being illegal be a problem for us in a couple of months' time? <laughs> Maybe that's why they said, ah, we'd put it on nine months because they know in it, you know, the, the, the fucking shit's about to get hot and heavy over there. <laughs> uh, Martin's asking, isn't uh, Simon Harris the prohibitionist? He certainly is. Um, he certainly is. Fucking, he, he is. He's the guy who allowed Vera to walk from Cork to Dublin. Don't forget, he allowed a mother walk to Cork from Cork to Dublin, over 300 kilometres uh, from Cork to Dublin. Um, she got support all along the way from the, the, the community. Um, but he allowed it to happen. He could have ended at any point in time with a phone call, but he didn't. He, he allowed her and she arrived on up to the gate, you know. And that she did. Oh. Let's, let's, let's fucking pay homage to that, man. Vera Thumi arrives at the dial. Like this. And forgive me, like, if I, if I get fucking emotional on this one, because, uh, jeez, man, that was such a horrible thing. Powerful, but a horrible thing for a mother to have to go through. You know? I'm just seeing if I can find that actual video. Because this one is like an hour long here, like. Just trying the hour long one, see. Think you know so much support there on that day, and yet still so many patients in this country are without a medicine. You think about that, like 
like so like she walked from Cork to Dublin, she achieved so bloody much, but yet still the policy makers were able to to keep it so limited that a very lim- very little people benefited. You know, I suffer with the same condition unfortunately as Ava. I, I suffer with epilepsy and I'm denied it. I'm still a criminal for my use of, of cannabis, you know? Mad. I, 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 my, my neurologist actually, uh, in my opinion anyways, uh, he stopped seeing me because uh, I wasn't responding well to the medications he was putting me on and I was insisting, hey, come on, like, give, give me, let me try this medical cannabis that, that's available on prescription um, and stop making me being a criminal. And the guy doesn't see me anymore. <laughs> Mad. I'll put back on the sound a sec. Uh, oh, Vera's going to get now her leading. What happened you think about it, like? So long ago. No. There she is at the gate. For you never walk alone. I don't know, I like, you know, like who right she should get this response for? <laughs> I was planting cannabis outside the city hall, I was bringing it into the, to the guard station. <laughs> it's nowhere near as bold as walking Cork to Dublin, like, but surely that, 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 that should have, uh, Res- getting respect and attention um, but I, I think it's because of the fact that it's like I'm fighting for my right and I'm fucking trying to awaken the people maybe that it was ignored a little bit a little bit <laughs> so they get highlighted off fairly well and she's actually at the gate Medium milk, the shit out of it, didn't uh, Four minutes there to the 420. They, they let her in eventually. Uh, right there, I think we get up the hair, look, they, they were inside at that point. So. Seven years ago. <laughs> oh, so we let, let that play out there I could turn off the sound but you know seven years ago my mother had to walk from Cork to Dublin to get access to medicine for her child. Child eventually got access, uh, much thanks to uh, after this walk, you know, they really put the pressure, the public uh, coming out in support of her, really put the pressure on the politicians that time. Um, and they allowed her access uh, for her daughter. Um, but again, it was just a ministerial license. It, it, it wasn't all that, like, it, was, it meant it was all that for that child, it was all that for that mother. But for the country, like, it was what was already in place. It was what uh, Yvonne Callan was already already getting only um, a couple of months, uh, I think it was, previous to that for her son, Tristan, um, who, you know, I hope is uh, still doing well. Um, and, and, you know, but, uh, yeah, fortunately, people like myself and many others, uh, there's people out there in the hot box, uh, still have to break the law um, to get access to their medicine. Martin saying things will change, mate. Even if uh, Simon Harris is too spineless to do it uh, himself, no, they will. But guys, like, it's us. We we we're the ones who have to stop being spineless. To be fair, we need again, unless Bob says, get up, stand up, guys, and if you're right, you know, or forever be denied them. Sadly, sadly, that is like I wish it wasn't the case, but it is. <laughs> Ah, look at me rushing to get my ball ready for 420. <laughs> All right, final one of the stream, guys, and I will love you and leave you because 
it's been an extra long stream. Um, I was thinking it might have been like a half hour, an hour. Um, didn't have a whole lot of news there, but these things just have a way of, you know, <laughs> you know. What did I do with that bit of hash, actually? Ten seconds and a bit. <laughs> oh, no. Happy 420, guys. Woo. So there we go, guys. Uh, three 420s and a one show. Boom. Gonna just take that little extra bit of time to, to prepare this bowl with some hash to finish off before we go in and unwind for the rest of the evening. Oh, there we go. And smell my fingers for a little while. <laughs> uh Actually, so nice. Like, I definitely would wear that, like, as a cologne or something. Like. Oh, <laughs> cannabis for men. <laughs> I thought I seen Wick around. Right, no Wick. Let's do this. Yeah, we can't put a date in the Martin, but it is like coming. Like John, you know, just know that 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 day it is there. It's coming. It's not an. It's not an if it will happen. It is a when it will happen. Like we will be liberated. Like and the wrongs of the past, they'll have to be righted, corrected, rectified. Is is righted? Yeah, righted definitely isn't the word. Bad grammar, Martin. <laughs> you write your wrong, but you didn't write it a wrong. <laughs> Silly stoner. <laughs> <coughs> uh, but yeah, that was that was a lovely ball. Oh, yeah. <coughs> oh, this tea is still nice and warm too. Oh. Slant that to everybody out there who's uh, stuck around for the entirety of the show. It's been an absolute pleasure to, to to bring this to you and to converse with you there in the hot box. Um, we're not done yet, though. I won't just say goodbye just yet. Let's see the last few comments coming in. Miles Chronic says, uh, Lizards going back underground. Uh, I'd imagine that's the reference to the, the politicians there jumping uh, off that sinking ship. Uh uh, yeah. Oh, God, what a disaster. This is Martin. Dahi Golden says uh, he was pointing fingers at cocaine users in the Doyle, blaming them for gangland war. No mention of 50 years of misuse of drugs act. No, and, and they won't die there, Dahi. Um, they, they, and and I, I have an article up there on this uh, calling out, um, what's her name? Fucking Nicola Tat. Is it that? No, not, is it not? Is it Nicola Talent? Was she the one who released that bloody book? I think it might have been her. She's going around doing a tour. Um, I think, yeah, it was her. Uh, she released a book, and, and in the book, she points the fingers at cocaine users, drug users, illicit drug users, as being the ones responsible for the bloodshed, the violence um, of the organised crime gangs. Um, and, and that was just repeated, like, fucking all over the airways as uh, her media campaign there to highlight her, her book tour, her book launch tour, or whatever it was, because she was doing a number of talks. And get this, a number of her talks were in pubs. <laughs> Oh, it was funny when I when I seen some of the locations. Uh, one one of them uh, it was in Cypress Avenue here in Cork. It's a pub, and it's a pub that holds like freaking raves and shit as well, man. Did they have some sick? Uh, I would just say uh, gigs inside there, um, inside Cypress An Avenue. And um, but she was in there and here in Cork. Like it's like what a hypocrite, like. <laughs> Um, so she she also is benefiting, like you know. So if you were to blame cocaine users, she's benefiting too. So she should be blamed, and um, because if she really was to call out what the problem is, which is prohibition, then like we could fix this. 
But no, she perpetuates it by blaming the drug users, knowing that that's never really going to fix things because you can't shame drug users really away from using drugs because for many drug users, they do so without harm inflicted on their life. And for those who does inflict harm on it, like it's very harm, hard to shame a person inflicted by addiction, you know. Uh, Jimmy Case 140 says that the T-boy walked past me near that fancy hotel in Dublin one day I never thought that such a wimp would become our leader same goes for that uh, last fella I suppose um, yeah but you see man this is the thing this is the thing like uh, the, these people like they, they're not really challenged though. it's so easy for them to get in they don't get challenged everything's so easy for them to be fair if you look at the system and how it plays out I ran in the election so as an outsider trying to get in I could kind of see how it was nice and easy for those guys who were already there, who were already established and everything, but there was really no interest in this outsider coming in a first time or running. I know it was only a by election at the time, but still a first time or coming in. Surely there should have been like a reason there to shine a bit more light on what this outsider coming in for the first time is, is saying, but instead, no, it was like fucking the, the other guys, you know, the, the Shinners, the Finnegalers, shine the light in them and bare mention of me they actually failed to mention me there in one article and I actually had to write one and say hey I'm running in this election too and he didn't have my name in there and they were oh sorry we let it there we let it and uh, I was like but it's not good enough that articles aren't being shared around now and seen you need to put, I was saying to him you need to write another article and actually highlight that she forgot to include me um, but they said that they, they couldn't do that I was a bit pissed but eh. <laughs> anyhow I'll certainly run in the next one as well, you know, just let that go uh, with, with saying <laughs> that the next election that happens here in Ireland, next general election, uh, potentially maybe even the next local election, um, you could see that name Martin Condon on the ballot paper as an independent. Um, and I will be running to, uh, with drug policy reform um, and a number of other issues there, you know, better working condition and uh, fair pay for people. Um, improvement in the cost of living and all that kind of crack fucking control of our, our, our rental improvement of uh, the, the uh, the ability for, for people to buy their own home <laughs> things like that but anyhow very true we will get there can't put a date now yeah we read that um, yeah yeah <laughs> Miles Chronic, great stuff as always, Martin. Thanks a lot. Not a bother at all, Miles Chronic. Uh, Keto Halloran says, uh, there to tick in the government for change. Yep. To tick in the government for change. Is it kick in the government for change? <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, so, there we go, guys. Um, that's pretty much it, anyway. I don't see any other comments uh, flying in. Um, going to get in there on why now for the rest of the evening hopefully catch the babbies before they go to bed as I say um, this went on a longer than we expected but it's always a pleasure to be on her with she hopefully you all enjoyed it as much as moi um, until next time um, keep an eye out for uh, the stream hopefully I'll be able to schedule something soon with the guys that were over at Spanibus uh, we'll talk Spanibus um, I know the Roven Reporter was on with the guys in High and Homegrown. I think that's up online for everyone to watch, if I'm correct, uh, Roven Reporter. Um, or is it only for subscribers? Could be wrong, but... Anyhow, if you want to get a bit of an early inside scoop on Spanibus, it's over there on High and Homegrown, uh, I think, for everyone to watch. Um, and you'll get it here very soon, featuring hopefully myself... Uh, the Roven Reporter and a couple of others to be confirmed. Mentioned uh, Mr. Wes there and Green Tea earlier. Um, hopefully we can get them. Hopefully we can get Joe, who uh, who was my roommate. <laughs> <laughs> Had a good crack with Joe. Uh, it was a great, great few days, to be fair now. Um, definitely uh, m much, much needed. Uh, so yeah, definitely much needed. Um, but yeah, as I said, look out for that one and uh, be back here as well uh, next weekend for more 420 news. So until then, guys, good night, God bless, still blazed out there and keep her lit. Mwah. <laughs>